Week 1, Unit 1, Exercise 1 Location matters to startups because the people who provide them with the resources they need to grow, revenues, talent, capital, advice, are more than producers of code or PowerPoint decks. They live in houses or apartments and commute to offices. They attend meetings and bump into each other randomly at coffee shops and in hallways and company founders seeking to build, develop, and sustain vital trust relationships with their startups, customers, suppliers, employees, mentors, and investors must meet with people in person repeatedly. Startups thrive or fizzle depending on the quality of these people and the strength of those relationships, and part of that quality depends on where a startup locates. Pick the right one, and the startup gets the resources that it needs to grow. Pick the wrong place to run the company, and it withers in the struggle to get those resources. Exercise 2 A political economy approach to the mass media has as its starting point the fact that the producers of mass media are industrial institutions, essentially driven by the logic of capitalism, the pursuit of maximum profit. The fact that these institutions are owned and controlled by a relatively small number of people and that many of the largest-scale firms are based in the U.S. is a situation involving considerable economic and ideological power. A number of accounts have traced the pervasive and increasing inequality in access to information and cultural products due to the commercialization and privatization of broadcasting, libraries, higher education, and other areas of public discourse. A small group of large industrial corporations have systematically acquired more public communications power than any private business has ever before possessed in world history, creating a new communications cartel. The music industry has been part of this process of consolidation. At issue is the consequent question of control of the media and whose interests it operates in, and the relationship between diversity and innovation in the market. Exercise 3 An early memory organizes certain perceived truisms about interpersonal living in a way that, unlike literature or myth, is tailored to the situation of the individual. Early memories are narratives that do not contain timeless rules about interpersonal living that are applicable to many of us. They contain small, tentative, revised rules about one individual's interpersonal world. An early memory would be similar to having a story like Anna Karenina written about oneself. The advantage is that it definitely relates to one's situation. The disadvantage is that it will have been written by us, not by a Tolstoy. When I say that it is a disadvantage not to have memories written by Tolstoy, I do not mean merely that they are less intriguing or interesting or well-crafted than a good novel. I also mean that the writer, 
the individual is not as smart about human nature as Tolstoy was. Early memories are literature that is often wrong about its subject matter in some important way. Exercise four. One foundation of our view of leadership is that leadership is relational. Put simply, you cannot be a leader without followers. Much of early trait theory seemed to ignore this, but trying to distill the characteristics of leaders, it neglected the fact that leadership is a relationship built actively by both parties. In reality, leadership is always a social construct that is recreated by the relationships between leaders and those they aspire to lead. Effective leaders are not simply amalgams of desirable traits; they are actively and reciprocally engaged in a complex series of relationships that require cultivation and nurture. Like all social creations, this web of relationships is easy to break and requires constant recreation. You can confirm this every time you talk to a successful CEO, a sports coach, or a team leader. All will tell you that much of their leadership effort is devoted to the maintenance of particular kinds of relationships with their followers. Exercise five. In a study, researchers interviewed residents of the state of Victoria over many years to see how life events and personality affected people's happiness. They wanted to know the extent to which a person's personality versus the things that happened to them affected well-being and happiness. Personality might account for, say, forty percent of happiness, whereas life events might account for sixty percent. Alternatively, perhaps personality would turn out to be more important. As the study progressed, it was clear that the same kind of things kept happening to the same people over and over again. Lucky people were lucky again and again. Likewise, people with lots of bad experiences, like relationship breakups and job losses, seemed to encounter one bad thing after another. Their assumption that personality and life events would have separate influences on happiness was wrong. Instead, personality itself had the strongest influence on what happened to people. The optimists had more positive experiences, while the pessimists had more negative experiences. Exercise six. Online consumer research studies confirm that when visitors land on a website, they experience stay or go moments within the first ten seconds. If it looks unprofessional or hard to use, they leave and usually won't be back. In other words, your target audience will judge you, your products and services, and your company in a snap, and you're likely to get only one chance to impress them. Given this, all website owners should be doing everything they can to ensure that their online visitors are blown away by their website's look, feel, and navigability. Unfortunately, this is often not the case. Quite a few short-sighted entrepreneurs underestimate the negative impact of poorly written copy, amateurish design, and convoluted navigation. Remember that this is one of those areas where it doesn't pay to be penny wise and pound foolish. It's just too important. Don't annoy, or worse yet, alienate prospective customers because your cousin's friend's aunt's next door neighbor's brother volunteered to design your website on the cheap. Exercise seven. It is crucial to value differences in our increasingly interdependent world. Even if you are not operating globally, but just in a workplace in a small town, you will find that there is an increasing level of diversity among the people you work with: old, young, tall, small, black, white, rich, or poor. You should not place more value on one over the other, because they are all needed to form the whole. That's called synergy, meaning that the whole is more than the sum of the individual parts. Value that. 
It may take some initial adjusting for all parties, but it pays off in the long run. Homogeneity is a thing of the past. Heterogeneity has proven its value. More brains, more values, more perspectives, better solutions, greater output, more creativity, and increased understanding. Those are just some of the advantages of embracing the fact that not all herrings in the barrel are the same. Exercise eight. We apply a finite set of explanations in many different contexts without considering the subtleties of each situation. This is the one-size-fits-all approach to problem solving. People who take this approach have blind spots. Areas where they fail to recognize that they are missing important things about a situation. Not only do their solutions often fail, they may not even recognize those failures, much less learn from them, so they can devise better solutions. Instead, they tend to force the data to fit their preconceived ideas. This is moving in the wrong direction of the feedback loop, from knowledge to reality. It is starting with what we already believe, and insisting that reality fit it. This is not the same as having core values. Core values can still be adapted to fit a variety of circumstances. The problem comes when those values become so rigid that they no longer work well in some situations. When they're applied arbitrarily without carefully evaluating their impact. This happens when we're no longer willing to ask ourselves the tough questions, when relevant feedback is ignored or dismissed. Exercise nine. Of cultivated crops, cereals were of the greatest economic importance in the Mediterranean region in ancient times, just as rice was the basic type of food in East Asia and Indian corn and quinoa in the Americas. Since wild plants were necessarily self-seeding for their survival, the early Neolithic farmers favored individual plants that had developed suicidal mutations that prevented the pod from opening naturally and scattering the seed. Thus, they were able to harvest their crop without losing grains and could later separate the seeds from the pods. Similarly, with animals. Those that exhibited juvenile characteristics were favored over the strong, and bred to eliminate their wild characteristics. This, the earliest form of genetic manipulation by humans, was eventually to make a significant portion of Mediterranean flora and fauna dependent on human assistance in reproduction and survival. Exercise ten. Although globalization processes are often blamed for language loss, in some cases communities and language activists, including linguistic anthropologists, are using web-based technology to save endangered languages. Bud Lane the Third is one of the last surviving speakers of Silets de Ni, an indigenous language in a small community in Oregon. Silets de Ni began to decline in the mid 1850s, when several cultural groups speaking different languages and dialects were placed on the same reservation. To communicate, they began speaking a Chinook jargon that replaced Silets de Ni. Fortunately, this language has been immortalized on a talking dictionary using Lane's own voice. This talking dictionary now contains fourteen thousand words, and with the language on the internet, young people in the community are beginning to learn the language once again. They even text in Silets de Ni. Other communities with endangered languages are also embracing social media, YouTube, text messaging, and websites as a vehicle for saving their languages. Exercise eleven. To be sure, one could try to interpret the unfiltered activity of another person's brain. At first, it would seem like incomprehensible static, but with practice and experience, a person who is visually handicapped would learn that certain kinds of static mean one thing, other kinds other things.
the brain is remarkably good at extracting patterns from seeming noise. For example, blind people can learn to see with a lollipop-shaped device resting on the mouth. It converts input from a video camera into electrical pulses. It maps the visual world onto the tongue. The electrical charge is said to feel like popping candy or champagne. At first, the user just feels weird sensations in her mouth, but gradually she learns to associate specific sensations with objects in front of her. After a little practice, users can see doorways and elevator buttons, pick out items at the dinner table, and even read letters and numbers. Though the input is oral and tactile, after a while the user starts to feel as though she is actually seeing. Exercise twelve. The title of Carson's book, Silent Spring, was a reference to a world without birds that could be the ultimate outcome of indiscriminate pesticide use. As a scientist, Carson researched her book carefully and grounded it in rigorous science. She made a forceful case for the severe damage that reckless spraying of pesticides had caused to wildlife and exposed the potential threat to humans as well. She did it with a passionate, poetic writing style that made the subject accessible to ordinary people. Up to that time, technology had been seen as the realm of scientists and government regulators, and Americans generally entrusted it to the experts who appeared to understand the complicated details of biology and chemistry. Carson pulled back the curtains. Silent Spring encouraged citizens to become informed and to become actively engaged, and in doing so, helped usher in the spirit of participatory democracy that characterized the 1960s. Week One, Unit Two, Exercise One. When you are thinking about specific subject matter, it's as important to consider from where you draw inspiration as how you think about what you paint. This is especially true for people who paint from their imagination and not from specific reference, or who make abstract works. These artists still find inspiration in their exterior worlds, but they process and apply that inspiration differently from people who paint directly from photo reference or life. For example, years ago, I became enormously interested in Scandinavian design and folk patterns. I had, at the time, never set foot in Scandinavia, so most of my inspiration was gathered from books or perusing the internet. I devoured so much inspiration that I eventually created my own imaginary scenes, most of which were in some distant, nameless Nordic land. I drew from the inspiration. But I created my own patterns and landscapes. Abstract or non-objective artists also process inspiration differently. What inspires their work is often the same stuff that inspires representational artists: landscapes, feelings, or colors. But the way they render their subject matter is not literal. Exercise two: Getting ready every day can be a drag. Brushing your teeth, combing your hair, and that whole annoying business of showering—it's impossible to multitask while doing that stuff, right? Nope. Aside from wanting to look and smell your best, the time you spend getting ready is prime time to be aware of everything you're doing. If you usually zone out while brushing your pearly whites in the morning, instead try thinking of all the ways you're helping yourself by having a sparkling smile. The least of which will mean fewer trips to the dentist. The goal here is simply focusing on the task at hand. Instead of whipping your comb through your hair in the morning like a madman, just focus on the act of brushing, not thinking of the ten other things you have to do to get ready this morning. What's the rush? Okay, well, you need to make sure you don't miss the bus. But beyond that, there is a lot of merit in diligence and focusing on personal hygiene. Exercise three. Some of us don't know what we're missing. We don't have access to our emotions, and we can't imagine what they feel like or what good could come of them. 
The difference between acknowledging our emotions and cutting off our ability to experience them can be as big as the difference between what a child at four knows and what a child at seventeen understands, or the difference between dating and falling in love. We can't know until we get there. Think of two turtles, one from a pond and one from an ocean, sharing stories. The pond turtle cannot comprehend the magnificence of the ocean because his pond environment is limited. The ocean turtle invites the pond turtle to go with him to the ocean because he knows that the pond turtle will only truly understand by seeing for himself. Exercise four: the conventional view of the proper relationship of the government to the media, as it developed in the United States, is well known to us all. The free press is generated by private citizens, independent of government censorship and control. By logical deduction, this means that media and communication are, in effect, a function to be provided by profit-seeking businesses competing in the marketplace. The First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees this freedom. And as long as the government keeps its hands off the media, a society's flow of information and ideas will be safe. Without government intervention, a healthy media system will invariably rise from the rich soil of political freedom. Let the government intervene, no matter how well intended the intervention may seem, and alarm bells should go off in the minds of all liberal and right-thinking people. The government and the private media are by nature in conflict. To paraphrase the immortal words of Thomas Jefferson. If a society could have either media or government, but not both, the same choice for free people is media. Exercise five, except in emergencies, an individual usually seeks confirmation of illness first from family or friends. Symptoms are described and a diagnosis is sought. A knowledgeable relative is often the most trusted person in determining whether a condition is cause for concern and whether further care should be pursued. In many cultures, a mother or grandmother is the medical expert within a family. This is a major step in social legitimization of the sickness. If others agree that the person is ill, then the individual can adopt a new role within the family or community. Sick person. In this capacity, the sick person is excused from many daily obligations regarding work and family, as well as social and religious duties. A reprieve from personal responsibility for well-being is also given, with care provided by relatives, healers, or health professionals. The role of sick person provides a socially accepted temporary break from the physical and psychological burdens of everyday life. With the understanding that sickness is not a permanent condition and that recovery should occur. Exercise six: If it is during the regular season in any sport like baseball, basketball, or hockey, and the game starts at seven p.m. or seven thirty p.m. on the West Coast, ten p.m. or ten thirty p.m. start time in the East, how many fans are going to stay up until after one a.m. on the East Coast? Not many. So the result is an East Coast bias that definitely exists because they miss many of the games that happen on the West Coast and don't get to know these teams as well. Sure, they get all the information the next morning, but not seeing the games live as they do on the East Coast can hinder their view of the Western teams. This is why those in the East think that more often than not, the East Coast has better teams than the West Coast. This makes sense and is a logical argument, but is it fair? Not always. But what can they do besides recording every game and watching it in the days or weeks to come, which I'm sure rarely happens? The East Coast bias will always exist through no one's fault. Time is of the essence, and you play the cards you're dealt by choosing where you live. Exercise seven. Each of us can see a different image of a chair, and depending on this image, we can create an opinion of the chair, which may be different from the opinion of this chair held by the person who is sitting on it. However, the fact that none of us has a complete vision of the chair is not a reason to think that there is no chair. There is an ontological truth of the chair that is the chair itself, 
regardless of how we see it, or even whether it is seen or not by somebody. If there were no truth, there would be no reality. The most curious thing is that Einstein never said that everything is relative. On the contrary, what he said was that the speed of light is an absolute constant. Relativity is a property of perception, of appearance, but it does not affect the essence of what is observed. Although, as Schrödinger said, on observing it, we modify it, which does not deny its existence, but rather confirms its existence. We also alter tools when we use them, and they are not less real due to this. If they were not modified, we would not have to sharpen scissors or pencils. Exercise eight: Law has little autonomy. Law's distinctively legal doctrines, principles, and procedures have little independent importance. Legal traditions do not, by themselves, account for much of the current content of law. Law is constantly changing because society changes. When law seems to stand still, it does so not because of the force of precedent, inertia, or lag, but because powerful background forces have stalemated and current interests are pushing back against pressures for change. Likewise, the forms of law, for example, whether it uses rules or standards, strict or loose interpretations of texts and legal instruments, are usually functions of background demands on legal systems. Change internal to the legal system cannot, in itself, bring about large social consequences. Law cannot consistently or for long periods remain out of sync with the interests of the powerful in society. The historian or social scientists look for explanations of legal change will most likely find them in the study of social interests, forces, and demands. Not in the doctrines, principles, or internal structures of the legal system. Similarly, legal change is most likely to be effective when it is supported by powerful interests. Exercise nine. It is worth remembering that the idea of classical music, widely accepted today, did not exist until about three hundred years ago. Performing music in concert halls to a paying audience as something inherently pleasurable and significant was pretty much unheard of until the 18th century, and not widely established until the 19th. The concert hall, the audience, and the idea of masterpieces of classical music were all effectively invented during the course of the 18th century in London, Paris, Vienna, Berlin, and other European cities. Much of the music that is now performed in public concerts was not composed for that purpose. The cantatas of J. S. Bach, for example, were written to be sung in religious services at the Church of Saint Thomas in Leipzig, where Bach was cantor. These pieces were part of weekly worship and included chorales, hymns for the congregation to join in with the singing. Sing along during a modern concert hall performance of one of these works today, and you're likely to be told to shut up. Exercise ten. Despite the accumulated frustration and rage brought about by our struggle to adapt ourselves to machines, genuine resistance to the machine is relatively rare. Our preconditioning to favor novelty keeps us fascinated by the machines. Generally, people try bravely, even enthusiastically, to accommodate themselves. They are not sure why they are consequently unhappy. They do not blame the machines, for we have convinced ourselves, or been convinced by advertising and promotion, of their marvelous natures and of our great need for them. We have created dependency where none existed. Forgetting that we survived and thrived as a species for hundreds of thousands of years, without the internal combustion engine or the cell phone, now too many of us feel lost and inadequate and frightened if the lights go out. We love our machines, after all, as we would a spouse in an enduring bad marriage whose flaws are so familiar, whose irritating voice is so much a part of the background that it is impossible to conceive its not being there. Alternatives are not even imagined. Exercise eleven. 
One of the techniques for getting behind the conscious veil people like to keep in front of themselves, particularly where you suspect that they are putting on a show for your benefit, is to switch the focus of the conversation from them to other people. On the basis that what people see in others reflects their own perspective, asking consumers what they think other people's motives are can be enlightening. Customers who are unwilling to reveal their own confusion with a product display will often be happy to point out that other people would find it confusing. One word of warning, though: it's important to distinguish those responses that are the result of you having asked the respondent to represent the views of others from when they voluntarily do so. The latter can be a form of social politeness. For example, when they think something is hopeless. But they try to soften the blow by suggesting that someone else who isn't present would think it was terrific. Exercise twelve. In a culture where screens replace craft, the philosopher mechanic Matthew Crawford argues people lose the outlet for self-worth established through unambiguous demonstrations of skill. One way to understand the exploding popularity of social media platforms in recent years is that they offer a substitute source of aggrandizement. In the absence of a well-built wood bench or applause at a musical performance to point toward, you can instead post a photo of your latest visit to a hip restaurant, hoping for likes or desperately check for retweets of a clever quip. But as Crawford implies, these digital cries for attention are often a poor substitute for the recognition generated by handicraft, as they are not backed by the hard-worn skill required to tame the infallible judgment of physical reality, and come across instead as the boasts of a boy. Craft allows an escape from this shallowness and provides instead a deeper source of pride. Week two. Unit three, exercise one. Crushing the tongue against the roof of the mouth drives the food mass into the taste buds, and this clamping or sucking motion intensifies and prolongs the flavor. However, taste also requires the intervention of the brain, which must recognize, evaluate, and categorize the stimuli from the mouth and nasal passages. The evaluative quality of taste, or the recognition and judgment of flavor, can be processed only in the brain. And as with the visual imagery of painting, the quality of taste is assessed in relationship to a history of tastes. The tasting subject frequently judges the outcome of the experience in opposition to or alliance with previous experiences of the same or similar tastes. This process might be defined as the syntax or semiotics of taste. A chef or diner may rate a dish as better or worse than the last time the gustatory composition was prepared, or describe a new taste combination in relation to one that is familiar. It tastes like chicken. Exercise two. Our errors about what others are thinking. Are a major cause of human drama, as we move through life, wrongly predicting what people are thinking and how they'll react when we try to control them. We haplessly trigger feuds and fights and misunderstandings that fire devastating spirals of unexpected change into our social worlds. Comedy, whether by William Shakespeare or John Cleese and Connie Booth, is often built on such mistakes. But whatever the mode of storytelling, well-imagined characters always have theories about the minds of other characters, and because this is drama, those theories will often be wrong. This wrongness will lead to unexpected consequences and yet more drama. The influential post-war director Alexander McKendrick writes, "I start by asking." What does A think B is thinking about A? It sounds complicated, and it is. But this is the very essence of giving some density to a character and, in turn, a scene. Exercise three. Generally speaking, 
A single mutation in an existing gene cannot produce a new gene with a different function. If two genes differ by only a single base pair, then a single point mutation could convert one into another. Usually, however, these two genes will be regarded merely as variants of the same gene, and will have an identical function unless the mutation is at some critical spot that makes the second gene non-functional. The same goes for other basic alterations, such as the deletion or repetition of an existing sequence. To get a gene with an entirely new function usually requires many, many alterations. A concatenation of several unlikely steps, a series of just the right mutations happening either all at once or one after another. Unlikelihood multiplies into impossibility. If I guessed the next card you draw from the deck, you'd be impressed but not amazed. If I guessed ten in a row, you'd suspect a trick because that would happen only about once every fifty quadrillion trials. Exercise four. A thing we need to consider about history that should make us skeptical is the unending disagreement among historians over the same events. Edward Gibbon was hardly the last word on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Historians have been arguing inconclusively about this matter since well before the sixth and last volume of Gibbon's history was published in 1789. And the arguments about whether Gibbon got it right, whether he correctly identified the cause of Rome's decline, have not turned on the discovery of new evidence unavailable to him. Narrative historians are forever rewriting the past, disputing one another's causal claims, and there is no reason to think they will ever cease to do so, even for events as long past as the fall of the Roman Empire. Two centuries after Gibbon published the first volume of his history, Mary Beard published her distinctly different account, SPQR, a history of ancient Rome, which rose to the top of many bestseller lists soon after. Thus, even after all that time, there's still no agreement on why the Roman Empire fell. Exercise five. One way in which someone's loyalty might be expressed is through a tendency to identify herself with the object of her loyalty. Such a loyal person, to some extent, treats the thing to which she is loyal as though it was her, feeling as she would feel and acting as she would act if certain things that are true of it were true of her. If your loyalty to your favorite sporting team is expressed in such a way, then you may feel like a success yourself when your team is doing well, and like a failure when your team is doing badly. You may feel pride when your team does something good, when it wins a tough game or raises money for charity, and you may feel shame when your team does something bad, when it gives a boring performance or mistreats its players. Such reactions exist beyond any tendencies to want to advance the interests of the object of your loyalty, to serve as its advocate, or to venerate it through involvement in appropriate rituals. Exercise six. For some reason, sound technology seems to induce a strange sort of deafness among its most advanced pioneers. Some new tool comes along to share or transmit sound in a new way, and again and again, its inventor has a hard time imagining how the tool will eventually be used. When Thomas Edison completed Edward Leon Scott de Martinville's original project and invented the phonograph in 1877, he imagined it would regularly be used as a means of sending audio letters through the postal system. Individuals would record their missives on the phonograph's wax scrolls and then pop them into the mail to be played back days later. Bell, in inventing the telephone, made what was effectively a mirror image miscalculation. He envisioned one of the primary uses for the telephone to be as a medium for sharing live music. 
An orchestra or singer would sit on one end of the line, and listeners would sit back and enjoy the sound through the telephone speaker on the other. So the two legendary inventors had it exactly reversed. People ended up using the phonograph to listen to music and using the telephone to communicate with friends. Exercise seven. As a pillar of its religion of progress and cult of technology, our society cultivates its great illusion, which is related to time. It leads modern man to believe that technological progress will enhance his quality of life far more than the machines, the means of transport, and communications of the last century. Since time has such an important place in human life and contributes so much to its quality, he is tricked into believing that technological progress in every domain will free up time, which he can devote to everything that makes him happy in life. In fact, the opposite happens. It is clear that the quicker the new media work to free up time, the less of it we have. More than anything else, it is the new media that reduce the time available for man's quality of life at work or elsewhere. They have given rise to a new way of life and have brought about the evolution of a new type of man, someone always in a rush and submerged with cares, who frantically pushes himself to do everything at top speed. Someone who can no longer act out or live things deeply, and who has lost the mastery of the rhythm and organization of his life. Exercise eight. Flock or pack behavior explains why the great apes, our closest biological relatives, have close families. There is also evidence to suggest that ancestral forms of human beings, such as Australopithecus. Who lived in Africa two to four million years ago, and more recently, their distant descendants, the Neanderthals, also lived in family groups. Ultimately, it's down to Darwin and evolution. Herding is an essential survival instinct. It's especially important if, as a species, you have evolved a larger brain as your means of survival, rather than thick skin, ferocious claws, or teeth. Thanks to evolution. Our bodies are remarkably flexible and are good at putting the brain's ideas into practice. Nevertheless, we lack the tiger's teeth, the elephant's hide, or the bear's muscularity. Our strength lies in numbers, and even more important, the ability to work together for the communal good. And families are the basis for that vital cooperation. I would suggest that the inbuilt human herd instinct, the need to communicate clearly and bond with others, lies behind most of mankind's subsequent achievements. Exercise nine. As analyses of the primal form of communication have advanced, so has the observed richness of its universal vocabulary. One suite of signals contains postures that display dominance within groups, as well as the means to achieve it in the first place. They turn out to be similar to those in social old world monkeys and apes. Deborah H. Grunfeld, a social psychologist at Stanford University, found that people feel more powerful and often are so in actuality when they display the following traits in the presence of groupmates. Behave expansively. Keep your hands away from your body. Make eye contact as you talk, but feel free to look away at your leisure. Don't explain yourself in any detail. Take ownership of the space around you, whether a boardroom or an office cubicle, in order to say to yourself and imply to others, "This is my table. This is my room. You are my audience." Exercise ten. Parents sometimes try to justify a child's bad behavior with the rationale, "Robert was running around with the wrong crowd." The implication is that Robert's behavior was influenced by or caused by the other members of the crowd. This may sound good, and it may be a correct assessment as far as it goes. 
but it leaves out the fact that Robert was also a willing, participating, and contributing member of this crowd, and that he probably influenced the others to about the same degree that they influenced him. Granted, crowds, e.g. gangs, sometimes do things collectively that the individual members may not do by themselves, but blaming the crowd for bad choices and irresponsible behavior misses the point entirely. First, friends, associates, crowds, groups are choices, and second, individuals influence and are influenced by those who make up the group. This is one very good reason why friends and close associates should be chosen carefully, not simply encountered and accepted. Over a period of time, it matters. Exercise 11. The game of baseball can provide a snapshot of why it's important to focus resources in the right areas to be successful. During the 2001 to 2010 Major League Baseball seasons, the New York Yankees have won one World Series title. Winning even one title would seem impressive for most ball clubs. However, when you consider that the New York Yankees continually have the highest payroll of any team, sometimes even two or three times the payroll, that single win record exposes an ineffective use of resources. This shows that having the most resources guarantees nothing. It's how we use or allocate those resources that truly matters. Smith College economics professor Andrew Zimbalist offers this analysis. The statistical relationship between a team's winning percentage and its payroll is not very high. When I plot payroll and win percentage on the same graph, the two variables don't always move together. Between 70 and 85 percent of a team's on-field success is explained by factors other than payroll. Exercise 12 In the previous volume of Holly Weird Science, we authors detailed the lengths to which writers and producers are going today to improve both the level of science dialogue in Hollywood productions and the depiction of both scientists and the culture of science. We also explored how complicated the issues of science accuracy in TV and film actually are, and how rare it is that a production can simply hire a science consultant and make everything correct. It is unreasonable to expect science-themed dramas to be documentaries. Getting technical details as correct as possible is about grounding the story in the real world and minimizing the kind of, oh please, moments that pull viewers out of the story, reminding them that they are watching a fiction. When it comes to accurate depiction of science on both the big and the small screen, the entertainment industry has met viewers more than halfway. Week 2, Unit 4, Exercise 1 Genetic counseling by telephone presents several unique challenges. Unlike the traditional hospital-based clinic appointment, the client may not have access to a quiet private location. Due to full-time employment or other commitments that prevent being at home during working hours, the client might need to be called on a mobile telephone. When telephoning, it is useful to keep in mind that confidentiality is important and expected, even if a client has provided a work or mobile number. It is best to ensure the client is indeed the person on the other end of the line before disclosing the purpose of the call. If someone else answers, it is preferable to state that it is a personal call and ask when the client is likely to be available. If pressed for more information, the genetic counselor can politely state the need to discuss the purpose of the call directly with the person involved. Exercise 2 If a boxer constantly drops his right hand when he makes a jab with his left, a good opponent will eventually throw a hard left hand just as the jab is thrown. The first step is to know that the right hand must stay up when punching to protect against a counterpunch. The next step is to build drills around this exact task. The first one could be 500 jabs a day against a heavy bag, all while concentrating on keeping the right hand up. Next, the boxer could practice with a trainer who uses a hand pad to take the fighter's jab while at the same time using a punching pad to hit his boxer in the face on each jab. 
Either he will get hit if it is not done right, or hopefully soon the fighter learns that if he wants to avoid getting hit in the face, he needs to keep his hand up. With enough practice and dedication, eventually he will learn this skill, which could be the difference in his whole boxing career. Almost every sport has similar issues, and the premier athletes will find flaws, and then spend all their time and energy fixing them. Even if the remedy is boring or monotonous to perform, they will know it will build muscle memory, which is the key to change. Exercise three. In the physical world, friends are people to whom we are attached by feelings, affection, or personal regard. In the world of social networking, however, the definition and application of the term friend is much more vague and loosely applied. For example, an individual who you have just met for the first time at a social gathering might not pass the test of being a friend in the physical world, but increasingly, this type of casual connection is more than enough to pass the friendship test in the virtual world. Simply knowing a person's face. Name or possible association with another friend is usually enough for many to enter into an online friendship with an individual. At other times, a simple friend request is sufficient, regardless of familiarity with the individual or any previous personal connection. In respect to online security and privacy, the choices made when befriending people in the digital world and the content. I.e., profile information, pictures, status updates, etc., shared with them should not be taken lightly, as such choices can have negative consequences in the real world. Exercise four: Our willingness to harm others when we are following the instructions of an authority figure has been demonstrated by studies that clearly mimic real-world situations. Researchers in one study asked participants to read various test questions to a supposed job applicant, who was actually an accomplice. The applicant was always played by the same person, a well-dressed man about thirty years old. The researchers told the participants that they were interested in examining how job applicants would react under pressure. So they wanted them to harass the applicant by making statements that progressed in offensiveness, including "If you continue like this, you will fail," and "This job is much too difficult for you." As the interview continued, the applicant pleaded with them to stop, then refused to tolerate the abuse and showed signs of tension, and eventually stopped answering the questions in despair. In the control condition, in which there was no authority figure urging them to continue, none of the participants got through all fifteen of the statements. But when the experimenter prodded them along, ninety-two percent went all the way through the list. Exercise five. During the past ten thousand years or longer, man as a whole has been so successful in dominating his environment that almost any kind of culture can succeed for a while, so long as it has a modest degree of internal consistency and does not shut off reproduction altogether. No species of ant or white ant enjoys this freedom. The slightest inefficiency in constructing nests, in establishing odor trails, or in conducting nuptial fights could result in the quick extinction of the species by predation and competition from other social insects. To a scarcely lesser extent, the same is true for social carnivores and primates. In short, animal species tend to be tightly packed in the ecosystem, with little room for experimentation or play. Man has temporarily escaped the constraint of interspecific competition. Although cultures replace one another, the process is much less effective than interspecific competition in reducing variance. Exercise six: Common expressions such as "I can't remember her name, but it'll come to me," "Let me sleep on it," and "It'll be interesting to see how I solve this problem." Indicate that you are relaxing the struggle of your conscious mind, and its consciously controlled striated muscles. You are allowing another part of you, your subconscious right brain, autonomic nervous system, and smooth muscles, to do the heavy lifting, and bring you a creative solution. In business, we all know of those folks who have brilliant hunches and intuition. They tend to daydream while taking a shower, working out at the gym. Or having lunch, 
and come up with inventions, innovative solutions, and creative out-of-the-box concepts. Like many fictional detectives, they don't struggle like bloodhounds or Scotland Yard to chase after small clues. Instead, they typically, like Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot, let the little gray cells do the work. Exercise seven: Why do we find it so difficult to slow down? We may, in part, be the inheritors of a work ethic which encourages us to believe that time must be used productively and efficiently. We feel we should be getting things done, ticking them off a list, but it could be that many of us are driven by fear. We are so afraid of having longer, emptier hours that we fill them with distractions. We strive to stay occupied. How often do we sit quietly on the sofa for half an hour without switching on the television, picking up a magazine, or making a phone call, and instead just thinking? Within minutes, we find ourselves channel surfing and multitasking. What exactly are we afraid of? On some level, we fear boredom. A deeper explanation is that we are afraid that an extended pause would give us the time to realize that our lives are not as meaningful and fulfilled as we would like them to be. The time for contemplation has become an object of fear, a demon. Exercise eight: Knowing how the honey bee lives in its natural world is important for a broad range of scientific studies. This is because Apis mellifera has become one of the model systems for investigating basic questions in biology, especially those related to behavior. Whether one is studying these bees to solve some mystery in animal cognition, behavioral genetics, or social behavior, it is critically important to become familiar with their natural biology before designing one's experimental investigations. For example. When sleep researchers used honeybees to explore the functions of sleep, they benefited greatly from knowing that it is only the elderly bees within a colony, the foragers, that get most of their sleep at night, and in comparatively long bouts. If these researchers had not known which bees are a colony's soundest sleepers when nightfall comes, then they might have failed to design truly meaningful sleep deprivation experiments. A good experiment with honeybees. As with all organisms, taps into their natural way of life. Exercise nine: Economic inequality can be objectionable because extreme inequality in income and wealth can mean that the poor must live in a way that is reasonably seen as humiliating. As Adam Smith observed, it is a serious objection to a society if some people are so much poorer than others that they have to live and dress in such a way that they cannot go out in public without shame. The evil here is comparative; it is not merely having ragged clothes or poor housing, but having to live and present oneself in a way that is so far below the standard generally accepted in the society that it marks one as inferior. As this reference to standards generally accepted indicates, economic inequalities have these effects only given certain prevailing attitudes about what is necessary in order for someone to be socially acceptable. So, what is objectionable in a certain combination of economic inequality and social norms? Exercise ten. One of the most important things on the part of the teacher is a willingness to show some humility. To reveal her struggles and to attempt to make her life and her message congruent, she doesn't have to be perfect, but she'll be a better teacher if she is using her own life as a laboratory for her ideals and methods. The most superb teachers are the wounded healers, the ones whose wisdom is tested in reality. Good teachers are always learning themselves, adapting what they know to a world that keeps changing. There's nothing worse than listening to someone who has polished a personal growth speech or a spiritual sermon that remains static over the years. While religious or academic training, degrees, books, and previous teaching positions are credentials that may indicate a highly trained teacher or therapist, equally important are the ways in which this person continually tests her knowledge in the world around her. Exercise eleven. Recently, new forms of service have been developed that were previously unavailable or performed within the domain of the private.
Sometimes referred to as effective or immaterial labor, these diverse services offer opportunities to utilize money in order to make more money. Investment firms and brokerage houses, or they facilitate access to the exchange of things. For example, banking and loan industries, and enhance and lubricate our desire for those things. For example, advertising industries, or they operate even more directly in the formation and maintenance of subjecthood. For example, personal trainers, life coaches, spiritual advisors, and caregivers. Additionally, new modes of production, such as Facebook and Instagram, have emerged wherein what is produced is a structure that channels the imaginative talent of the users of that structure, such that they create its again immaterial content. Even within these industries that do not generate actual things, a large number of jobs are devoted to making customers feel good, or to preparing new workers for innovation, managing up, and creative team play. Experience itself is now marketed. Exercise twelve. As we live in a world made of software, programmers are the architects. The decisions they make guide our behavior. When they make something newly easy to do, we do a lot more of it. If they make it hard or impossible to do something, we do less of it. When coders made the first blogging tools in the late '90s and early 2000s, it produced an explosion on self-expression. When it's suddenly easy to publish things, millions more people do it. And when programmers invented file-sharing tools around the same time, a shudder ran through the entertainment industries as they watched their lock hold on distribution suddenly evaporate. In fact, they fought back by hiring their own programmers to invent digital rights management software, putting it in music and film releases, making those wares trickier for everyday folks to copy and hand out to their friends. They tried to create artificial scarcity. If wealthy interests don't like what some code is doing, they'll pay to create software that fights in the opposite direction. Code giveth and code taketh away. Week three, unit five, exercise one. It has been suggested that people gradually internalize norms to which they initially adhere for reputational reasons. A person tells the truth because he fears a reputation for dishonesty, but over time he internalizes the norm of truth-telling, and tells the truth because if he lied he would feel guilty. I do not know whether this is true. But it certainly sounds reasonable. A better example might be that of a person who migrates from a culture in which people greet by bowing to a culture in which people greet by shaking hands. This person initially shakes hands because he realizes that if he failed to do so, he would offend people. Over time, he gets into the habit of shaking hands. He does not have to think about whether it is appropriate in a particular context. He just does it, instinctively relying on a newly gained cultural competence. Exercise two. The key issue with any disposal option is safety, which is mainly achieved by concentration and containment involving the isolation of suitably conditioned radioactive waste in a disposal facility. Containment uses many barriers around the radioactive waste to restrict the release of radionuclides into the environment. Such an approach is key to waste storage and disposal. It is termed the multi-barrier concept and is often called matryoshka after the popular Russian doll, which has inside of each larger doll a smaller one, so that the total number of dolls barriers is large. The confining barriers can be either natural or engineered, that is, obtained via processing. Radioactive materials are used extensively in medicine, agriculture, research, manufacturing, non-destructive testing, and minerals exploration. The accepted approach is to use more reliable barriers for more hazardous waste, including engineered barriers, which results from the radioactive waste treatment and conditioning processes. Exercise three: The law of the nineteenth century and today encouraged producers to pump quickly. Oil discoveries were governed by the rule of capture, developed in medieval England to resolve hunting disputes. 
It stated that if a deer or a bird moved from one estate to another, the latter estate's owner could kill the animal with no recompense to the former. For no one can say how and why deer or birds move. They are part of the commons shared by all. Similarly, landowners had the right to draw whatever wealth lay beneath it, even if drilling sucked their neighbor's property dry. As one English judge wrote, the rule of capture applied because no one really understood what happened in the hidden veins of the earth. In effect, the rule of capture meant take as much as you can as fast as you can before your neighbor does the same to you. Conservationists and economists know this problem as the tragedy of the commons. It is a tragedy founded in ignorance. Exercise 4. It was only fifty years ago that humanity began to extend its presence into space, first with robots, then with animals, and finally with humans. This tentative expansion of our species towards other worlds has been made possible by the development of technology, which has finally started to reach a level that can complement and support our imagination and desire for exploration. However, considering the size of the universe and the growing number of promising sites on many worlds where life might quite like to snuggle up, the search has barely begun. When we finally find life on another world, and we will, it will be one of the most significant cultural events in human history, having a profound impact on the question of our origins. It is not surprising, therefore, to find that such possibilities have been discussed by every human civilization and culture, primitive or advanced, as far back as we have written records. Even before these thoughts were given a name, such extraterrestrial wonderings found their outlet through myths, cave paintings, fictional literature, music, and poetry, then later through films and TV shows. Exercise 5 through 6. Negative experiences might have value for a person. For instance, working the graveyard shift in a bottling plant one summer while in college toughened me up. But negative experiences have inherent negative side effects, such as psychological discomfort or the health consequences of stress. They can also create or worsen conflicts with others. When my wife and I were tired and exhausted raising two young children, we snapped at each other more often. The costs of negative experiences routinely outweigh their benefits, and often there's no benefit at all, just pain with no gain. Since neurons that fire together wire together, staying with a negative experience past the point that's useful is like running laps in hell. You dig the track a little deeper in your brain each time you go around it. On the other hand, positive experiences always have gain and rarely have pain. They usually feel good in the moment. Additionally, the most direct way to grow inner strengths, such as determination, a sense of perspective, positive emotions, and compassion, is to have experiences of them in the first place. If you want to develop more gratitude, keep resting your mind on feeling thankful. If you want to feel more loved, look for and stay with experiences in which you feel included, seen, appreciated, liked, or cherished. The answer to the question of how to grow good things inside your mind is this take in experiences of them. This will weave them into your brain, building up their neural circuits. So, you can take them with you wherever you go. Exercise 7. In oral cultures, knowledge is limited to the collective memory of the group. This puts a serious limitation on the amount that can be known, and it makes such knowledge very fragile. If the wisdom of the tribe is not committed to memory, then it cannot be passed on to the next generation and will be permanently lost. Given this, Oral societies tend to encode their knowledge in formulaic patterns, such as rhymes, proverbs, and cliches, which are easy to memorize. They also tend to be cognitively conservative. For any experimentation or divergence from established ways of thinking puts the wisdom that has been accumulated over generations at risk. On the plus side, members of oral cultures are sometimes capable of prodigious feats of memory. 
Some scholars speculate that Homer's Iliad was originally an oral text, which, despite being passed on by word of mouth from one storyteller to the next, was preserved with remarkable fidelity. Indeed, the story itself may have been composed centuries before it was first written down. Exercise eight: Attempts to end government support for destructive fossil fuels are already underway. The End Oil Aid Bill, introduced in the U.S. in April 2007, seeks to end government support for the international operations of oil companies, calling on international financial institutions to stop financing oil and gas projects. Calculations by the World Bank and the OECD show that removing such support globally could reduce carbon dioxide emissions by around 10 percent worldwide. There has been a controversy about whether environmental regulation by international organizations is at least partially responsible for the observed decline in recent economic growth. Similar proposals were put forward in 2001 at a meeting of the G8 in Genoa. Where a report commissioned by member countries called on nations to remove incentives and other supports for environmentally harmful energy technologies, it also encouraged them to shift the priorities of international lending agencies like the World Bank to support more clean energy projects in poor countries. Exercise nine. Edison knew, as did others, that running electricity through a variety of materials could make those materials glow. A process called incandescence, thereby producing a light source that could be used as an alternative to candles and natural gas lamps. The problem was that the glowing material, the filament, would degrade after a short while, making its use as a household lighting device impractical. Not knowing any of the physical principles by which electricity destroyed the filament, Edison simply tried every material he could to see if one would glow brightly yet resist burning out. After trying sixteen hundred different materials, including cotton and turtle shell, he happened upon carbonized bamboo, which turned out to be the filament of choice, to the joy of turtles everywhere. When used in an air evacuated bulb, i.e., a vacuum tube, the carbonized bamboo outshone and lasted much longer than any of the other tested filaments. Edison had his light bulb. Although tungsten soon replaced carbonized bamboo in home light bulbs, illumination by incandescence became the predominant mode of interior lighting for many decades to follow. Exercise ten: Horses and mules learn through many small steps, and your ability to follow through successfully with the small steps will help you refine your animal to whatever level you desire. Introducing a new watering device or some other barn feature will give you an opportunity to help the animal to learn. Let's say that the waterer is an automatic one with a ball to push to access the water reservoir. The horse will not know to push on the ball unless taught. You can teach him to push the ball by first familiarizing him with the waterer, then bounce the ball up and down. The animal may startle at first. But will soon recognize the ball as harmless. Push the ball down so the water comes to the surface and splash your hand in it. Remember, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You will probably have to repeat this process more than once. Exercise eleven through twelve. Technology has opened up the possibility of working, communicating, producing, and being entertained whilst only using one or two small devices. All of the tools we use to need—paper, notebooks, pens, pencils, erasers, paper clips, staplers, and on and on—can all be tipped in the trash. With them can go surplus electronic equipment such as calculators, DVD players, radios, TVs, home telephones, cameras, and printers, followed by the redundant books, DVDs, CDs, and photographed albums. Minimalism is an idea of the internet age, and it is noticeable that while minimalists advocate a life without many of the things most of us take for granted, they cling to their laptops and tablets. Little wonder, for these are the devices that make minimalism possible.
the laptop is the perfect minimalist tool for work, leisure, and a whole lifestyle. If the family gathered on the living room sofa watching TV symbolized 20th century consumerism, the minimalist with a laptop symbolizes a new era. Minimalism is sometimes presented as a getting back to essentials or returning to a simpler way of life. But rather than giving up things, it is perhaps better to think of minimalism as the digitalization of our possessions. Instead of filling their homes, minimalists fill hard drives. It is a way of streamlining our lives to make the most of the technology available. Week 3, Unit 6, Exercise 1. One can draw a line of descent from Isaac Newton, the greatest scientist of his day, to Benjamin Franklin, the greatest scientist of his. By carefully observing and mathematically calculating the effects of gravity, Newton showed that one could predict the motions of the heavenly bodies. Reading Principia by Newton, John Locke was struck that generations of philosophers had been so preoccupied with their own comprehensive metaphysical systems that they failed to be open to the lessons of experience. Similarly, it seemed to Locke that abstract and interminable arguments about such problems, as whether human beings are naturally free, led political philosophy down a blind alley. The point is rather that people are at liberty to do what they decide to do, and that government should focus on conduct. The people, too, should respect state sovereignty only insofar as the actions of the state contribute to the protection of their rights as social contract. Exercise 2. Public performance of music in non Western cultures occurs in a freer, more relaxed environment. In Africa, it is not uncommon to see a group of accomplished musicians surrounded by people who join in by singing, clapping, playing rattles, and dancing along. In Indian Hindustani music, tradition dictates that the audience supply the tala, beat, and meter by quietly clapping. In general, the Chinese instruments used to play the melodies are more natural than those in the West, meaning that the materials from which they are made are readily found in nature. Interaction between the performers and the community is an important part of the music making process. Prior to the 19th century, concerts in the West were similar to this freer, more interactive experience. Not until the Romantic era, when composers made musical compositions, admired works of art, and composers themselves became geniuses, was the audience required to sit in respectful, meditative silence. Exercise 3 Volunteer work includes activities that we choose to engage in beyond the realms of paid employment and household work, whether joining community based organizations or just helping neighbors. The fact that these activities have tended to be more freely chosen than paid employment and household work has probably contributed to their continuing devaluation. But empirical researchers have now clearly documented that, in several advanced economies, Participation in voluntary organizations has witnessed substantial decline over the past few generations. The causes and significance of this decline have been hotly disputed. However, the general trend is now widely acknowledged, along with heightened concern about getting more people engaged in community contexts. As the incidence of volunteer work declined, appreciation of its importance for revitalizing social life began to grow. Exercise 4. Safety issues may be the last thing on your mind when exercising, but by working out safely, you will enjoy the amazing benefits of high intensity interval training and avoid becoming susceptible to any injury. Before anything else, it is important to say that exercise has more positive effects than it does potential negative ones. People who start a progressive exercise regime with a body that is free from disease, injury, or physical restriction will feel better than they did when they did nothing. A fact of exercise, however, is that some people suffer injuries, the cause of which can sometimes be difficult to establish because often there are contributing factors that have a knock on effect. These may include what a person has been doing in the hours preceding their workout, or what they have or haven't eaten or drunk. Being hydrated, for instance, has a harmful effect upon a subsequent exercise session, and therefore may be a factor if injury subsequently occurs. Exercises 5 through 
The language of poetry is like the future, full of vague hints, a mixture of fact and opinion, unclear forms, and incomplete models. It is open and emotional, accommodates multiple meanings, and is frequently controversial. It allows a multitude of paths, detours, and escapes. Different readers will not necessarily agree on what the poem is about, but they will be able to discuss the different assumptions that underlie their conclusions. The language of business, by contrast, seems clear. In the operational and financial spheres, terms are tightly defined to enable efficient communication and effective collaboration within and beyond the global enterprise. Poetry has little to add here. It will not help you make new calculations, build better projections, minimize scrap, balance a budget, or locate a factory in China. But when it comes to the sphere of strategy, executives can often find themselves, as is said of the British and the Americans, divided by a common language. Despite or perhaps because of this, the various frameworks that try to pin the concept of strategy down, words become buzzwords. And are never questioned. Recipients of directives interpret them in their own way and act accordingly. A well-developed poetic competence can help executives look behind the words to find, weigh, and resolve alternate meanings. Beyond its value in clarifying semantic ambiguity, poetry can also help develop both a tolerance for and a facility with situational ambiguity. The manager will be able to traverse Karl von Clausewitz's fog of uncertainty with both greater courage and greater impact. By understanding the multiple meanings at the heart of ambiguity, the manager's ability to make appropriate decisions on the fly is enhanced. Exercise seven: Energy companies across the Midwest are building new plants to convert locally grown corn into ethanol. The construction spurt is the most visible evidence of expanded interest in renewable fuels, which politicians increasingly believe can begin to wean America from its voracious appetite for foreign oil. Ethanol, the only renewable fuel being produced in the United States in any significant quantity, is being aggressively promoted as a key ingredient in the quest for energy security. But before competing head to head with gasoline, it will have to overcome major hurdles. Not only is it more expensive to produce, but some studies say it takes more energy to process corn into ethanol than the fuel delivers. Experts believe a more viable long-term ethanol source could be switchgrass or other so-called cellulosic biomass. The current biofuels boom is also a good sign for other renewables, including biodiesel, which has achieved popularity in Europe. Exercise eight. It's worth noting that refusing to use social media icons and comments to interact means that some people will inevitably fall out of your social orbit. In particular, those whose relationship with you exists only over social media. Here's my tough love reassurance: let them go. The idea that it's valuable to maintain vast numbers of weak tie social connections is largely an invention of the past decade or so. The detritus of over exuberant network scientists spilling inappropriately into the social sphere. Humans have maintained rich and fulfilling social lives for our entire history without needing the ability to send a few bits of information each month to people we knew briefly during high school. The question of whether or not you continue to use social media as a digital minimalist and on what terms is complicated and depends on many different factors. Nothing about your life will notably diminish when you return to this steady state. As an academic who studies and teaches social media explained to me, I don't think we're meant to keep in touch with so many people. Exercise nine: Organic material occurs naturally in aquatic environments. Fish die, leaves fall into streams, and soil washes into rivers. This kind of material is fairly insoluble, however. It breaks down quite slowly, so it does not demand a lot of oxygen all at once. It's a different picture when you pour thousands of liters of sewage into a lake. 
because sewage is made up of lots of small bits of organic material dissolved or suspended in water. It starts to break down very quickly, creating an immediate demand for large amounts of oxygen. Furthermore, as it breaks down, reduction as well as oxidation can occur. When organic material is reduced, it liberates ammonia. Neither oxygen depletion nor ammonia liberation is good for fish or other aquatic organisms. For example, salmon and trout require a minimum oxygen level of six milligrams per liter to live in a river. Trout cannot grow if the ammonia concentration exceeds 0.025 milligrams per liter, and they will die if it exceeds 0.25 milligrams per liter. Exercise ten. No cucumbers burp. The compounds called cucurbitacins produced in the skin of the fruit can have an adverse effect on the digestive system of those who eat them. Cucurbitacins also taste bitter, ruining the best cucumber sandwich. Due to genetic differences, one person in five can't taste cucurbitacins at all, which explains why some people think others are crazy when they complain about bitter-tasting cucumbers. But two in five people have an acute sensitivity to cucurbitacins, which makes it understandable if they think the rest of us are crazy for eating cucumbers at all. The standard solution to the problem used to be simply peeling the offending skin, but people are not the only ones affected by cucurbitacins. Insect pests are attracted to the compounds and focus on cucumber plants that produce them, either naturally or through stress. So when plant breeders developed burpless varieties with little to no cucurbitacin in the skins, everyone was happy but the bugs. Exercises eleven through twelve. One important type of evidence in court is character evidence, that is, evidence about a defendant's traits and natural tendencies. In certain circumstances, the defense can introduce witness to describe positive characteristics of a defendant that would make it unlikely that he committed a particular crime. For example, a witness might testify that the defendant is kind and gentle, suggesting that he would not be likely to have committed a cruel assault. Although one might expect this kind of testimony to help the defendant, research shows that positive character evidence has little effect on jurors' guilt judgments or likelihood of conviction. Paradoxically, the use of character evidence may actually increase the likelihood that a defendant will be convicted. This ironic outcome occurs because the prosecution is allowed to cross-examine character witnesses to try to show that they are not good judges of the defendant's character. During cross-examination, prosecutors might ask a witness whether she knows about previous behaviors by the defendant that contradict her testimony. For example, a prosecutor might say, "You said the defendant is kind and gentle." Are you aware that he was removed from high school after injuring another student in a fistfight? Although jurors are only supposed to use this information to evaluate the credibility of the character witness, it may influence their impressions of the defendant as well. Research shows that a defendant is more likely to be convicted when jurors hear positive character testimony that is cross-examined with negative information than when they hear no character evidence at all. Week four, Unit Seven, Exercise One. Did any travelers complete the arduous journey from the Indus Valley to Mesopotamia, or vice versa, in the third millennium B.C.E.? Whether traveling over land or by sea, the trip would have been well over a thousand miles. There is no evidence from the Indus Valley excavations that suggests the presence of Mesopotamians. Of course, ongoing research in the Indus region could establish otherwise. However, there are hints from the digs at Ur, a major Sumerian city-state on the Euphrates, that some Indus Valley merchants and artisans, bead makers, may have established communities in Mesopotamia. One leading researcher at the Indus Valley sites also has put forth the view that the ten attendants buried at Ur with Queen Puabi around 2500 B.C.E. were women from the Indus Valley, perhaps sent to Puabi as part of a diplomatic agreement. 
DNA analysis of the remains of the attendants who were buried wearing Indus-style carnelian beads could confirm this view. Exercise 2 Like buildings, some vehicles are designed from the inside out, while others are conceived with a predetermined form into which people and activities must fit. Many modern cars are shaped around the ergonomics of the passenger cell. Alternatively, if office buildings are often shaped like cereal packages, certain types of vehicles are either boxes or tubes, whose forms are conditioned by factors other than the needs of their potential occupants. Such factors include economics, construction technology, laws of physics, or a particular infrastructure, street layout in the case of architecture, road or rail networks in relation to vehicles. However, architecture is required in order to serve functional needs, while art is usually a free-form function that is purely about things like spirit, ideas, and aesthetics. Nevertheless, although they are similar in shape, the difference between the interior of a boxcar and a Pullman dining car is fundamental, just as a house and a warehouse are different species. Exercise 3 Everyone talks about the innovation economy, but no one knows exactly where it begins. If innovation means new businesses and new ways of working that depend on digital technology, we can trace its origins to mid-20th century centers of research and electronics production like California's Silicon Valley and Route 128 in Boston. But if we want to know about the current era of platform capitalism, we look for innovation in new centers of software development in every big city of the world, beginning with San Francisco, New York, London, and Shanghai. Moral judgments also shape our search. Although critics of the new economy are outraged by precarious labor and digital surveillance, people who work within the self-styled tech community prefer an aspirational discourse of innovation and entrepreneurship. Yet one thing is sure, despite contrasting views. Cities today are crucial sites for both the creation of and resistance to a powerful interplay of land, labor, culture, and capital that forms the base of the new economy, the innovation complex. Exercise 4 The potential for recycling to contribute to sustainable communities has been questioned. Critics point out that the prevailing recycling model is dependent on a market for recyclable materials. In order to be profitable, new products must be manufactured using the recycled material and consumed. This process takes emphasis off the need to reduce consumption, the increase in which is a major factor in the waste increase in the first place. Even with increases in recycling rates, without reductions in consumption, the amount of waste sent to landfills and incinerators and the amount of raw materials consumed will continue to increase. The existence of recycling programs is sometimes represented as a defense against the need to reduce consumption. For example, the bottled water industry, which has been criticized on multiple environmental grounds, notes that it encourages the recycling of plastic bottles. The majority of recycled plastic beverage bottles, however, are manufactured into other products, and new plastic bottles are made from virgin materials. Exercise 5 through 6. Credit Sigmund Freud with helping start a popular misconception that continues to this day. His ideas about the importance of emotional catharsis became part of what psychologists now call the hydraulic model of anger. In essence, this model holds that frustration leads to anger, and that anger then builds up until it is released in some way. The implication is that if someone is angry, he needs to vent his anger verbally or physically, or he may explode. Fritz Perls, the prominent psychiatrist, argued that if a person bottles up his rage, we have to find an outlet. We have to give him an opportunity for letting off steam. This idea has penetrated popular culture for many years. Youngsters should be taught to vent their anger, wrote famed advice columnist Ann Landers in a column some years ago.
and pop self-help books advise people to punch pillows or punching bags or to hit couches with plastic bats to get rid of their bottled-up anger. But this kind of venting, says Brad Bushman, Ph.D., an associate professor of psychology at Iowa State University, is like using gasoline to put out a fire. It only makes matters worse. The reason, he says, is that venting anger keeps people aroused, increasing the chance that they will say or do something that may be harmful or violent. In a series of fascinating experiments, Bushman angered students by showing them negative comments. For example, this is one of the worst essays I have ever read about something they had written. He then gave them the chance to wail on a punching bag and then to zap an opponent with a loud offensive noise. He found that the more the students had liked punching the bag, the more aggressive they were in sound blasting their opponents. The point, says Bushman, is that when people express their anger physically, by yelling, slamming doors, or hitting things or people, it keeps their anger alive and allows them to rehearse being angry. Exercise 7. The proportions of the demographic classes affect the fitness of the group and ultimately of each individual member. A group comprised wholly of infants or aging males will perish, obviously. Another, less deviant group has a higher fitness that can be defined as a higher probability of survival, which can be translated as a longer waiting time to extinction. Either measure has meaning only over periods of time on the order of a generation in length, because a deviant population allowed to reproduce for one to several generations will go far to restore the age distribution of populations normal for the species. Unless the species is highly opportunistic, that is, unless it follows a strategy of colonizing empty habitats and holding on to them only for a relatively short time, the age distribution will tend to approach a steady state. In species with seasonal natality and mortality, which is to say nearly all animal species, the age distribution will undergo annual fluctuation. But even then, the age distribution can be said to approach stability, in the sense that the fluctuation is periodic and predictable when corrected for season. Exercise 8. Communications is the most valuable skill the human race has, and technology has evolved to either extend it or enhance it. In any event, technology is classified as successful when it improves communications. Knowledge alone is not enough to improve the human condition. Communications must accompany knowledge, or no improvements can occur. Being able to teach what has been learned is what makes knowledge valuable. There is a strong belief among technology educators that technology constitutes a type of formal knowledge that can be reduced to curricular elements. If knowledge could not be communicated, then it would die with its discoverer and would need to be rediscovered each time a human being went down that same knowledge path. If it were not for synthetic speech and technology, the knowledge and thoughts of the genius Stephen Hawking could not be shared with the rest of the planet. Exercise 9. After it has been collected, the argon fruit is then air-dried for a few days before it is ready to be peeled. The peel is latex-rich, and once dried, the brown, wrinkled peel still sticks to the argon nut. Women use stones to weaken the peel, then remove it manually to get to the argon nut, which is the size of a large olive. Argon peel is frequently given to cattle. Goats are also very fond of argon fruit, and when grass is scarce, they do not hesitate to climb into the trees to eat the fruit. Later, they regurgitate the peeled argon nuts, either underneath another tree or in their stables. Because argon fruit peeling is a long and tedious task, fruit collectors are sometimes tempted to collect the regurgitated fruit which has already been peeled. Not only does this practice raise microbiological concerns, but it also modifies the flavor of the oil. Argon oil prepared wholly or in part from regurgitated fruit is of low quality and is frequently sold to tourists along the roads in plastic bottles. Exercise 10. 
Heat and cold tolerance are greatest in individuals who grow up in the conditions of high heat or considerable cold, while persons who move to such conditions can acclimate after a few days without achieving the full tolerance capacity of the natives. There has been some natural selection for tolerance of cold in the Arctic and in places like the central desert of Australia, where nights are close to freezing, although days are warm. Inuit in the Arctic have the best blood flow to hands and feet of any population tested, a capacity that keeps the hands and feet warm, protecting against frostbite. Central Desert Australian Aborigines are accustomed to sleeping near a fire in a light shelter, a custom that allows their skin on the side away from the fire to cool to a degree that sets foreigners to shivering. Whether these Australians' ability to sleep without feeling discomfort is due to natural selection for tolerance, to habit since early childhood, or to a combination of genotype and habit has not yet been determined. Exercise 11 through 12. One way to cope with the inherent uncertainty about an innovation's consequences is to try out the new idea on a partial basis. Most individuals will not adopt an innovation without trying it first on a probationary basis in order to determine its usefulness in their own situation. This small-scale trial is often an important part of the decision to adopt. In some cases, an innovation cannot be divided for trial, and so it must be adopted or rejected completely. Innovations that can be divided for trial are generally adopted more rapidly. Most individuals who try an innovation then move to an adoption decision, if the innovation has at least a certain degree of relative advantage. Methods to facilitate the trial of innovations, such as the distribution to clients of free samples of a new idea, usually will speed up the rate of adoption. For example, seed corn salesmen in Iowa in the 1930s gave a small bag of the new seed to Iowa farmers entering the decision stage. The free seed was enough to plant about an acre of corn, a large enough trial to convince a farmer to adopt the new idea on all of his corn acreage in the next few years. The trial of a new idea by a peer can substitute, at least in part, for the individual's trial of an innovation, at least for some individuals and for some innovations. This trial by others provides a kind of vicarious trial for an individual. Change agents often seek to speed up the innovation decision process for individuals by sponsoring demonstrations of a new idea in a social system. A demonstration can be quite effective in speeding up the diffusion process, especially if the demonstrator is an opinion leader. Week 4, Unit 8, Exercise 1 Given that the Internet has become integrated in everyday lives and the communication of social support is an important part of interpersonal interaction, it is not surprising that much support is provided and received online. People can get in touch with others who are facing the same or a similar situation and can exchange informational or emotional support as they would like to do in an offline situation. Even though relationships are acquired in a different manner, in time, some of them can become just as broad and deep as relationships that are formed offline. Nevertheless, interacting via the Internet has a number of characteristics that make it fundamentally different from face-to-face -face communication. The features of computer-mediated communication can affect how people compose messages, how they acquire and maintain relationships, and how groups are organized and structured. Online support groups may therefore offer some unique characteristics compared to offline groups, in which they allow anonymous participation, are text-based, and facilitate place and time independent interactions that offer possibilities to expand social networks. Exercise 2. The variety of ways in which students in music class can now interact with sound offers greater opportunities to individualize instruction. The wide variety of software environments now available allows teachers to tailor assignments and levels of support to meet particular students' needs. By varying projects according to student readiness, learning style, and interest, 
music teachers can differentiate their instruction, a task that can be challenging in many traditional music instruction formats. Music educators have stressed the importance of teacher demonstration to provide students with oral examples. For example, the use of headphones allows students to work simultaneously on different projects without sonically interfering with other music activities in the classroom. The use of this simple piece of technology significantly expands the teacher's ability to facilitate multiple group or individual projects in the same classroom space. A student and the teacher are working together. Another student is intent at the piano. And a third student is playing acoustic guitar without interference by the use of headphones or earbuds. Exercise three: Colleges use price discrimination. In 1995, for example, Johns Hopkins University began offering aid according to the students' price elasticity of demand for attending the university. Johns Hopkins wanted to attract academically gifted students who would major in humanities. But might attend other universities. These students had relatively elastic demand curves for education at Johns Hopkins, given the availability of substitute universities. By granting them an extra three thousand dollars in aid, the university was able to increase enrollment in that group by twenty percent. However, Johns Hopkins did not worry about losing prospective pre-med students, whose demand curves for education at Johns Hopkins were relatively inelastic. Because most of these students were already hooked on its pre-med program, a price increase would not knock many out. Johns Hopkins cut this group's aid by one thousand dollars per student and still increased net revenue. Today, this pricing strategy is being tried out at colleges and universities all over the nation. Exercise four. In 1950, Alan Turing published his famous article, "Computing Machinery and Intelligence," in the journal Mind. This article is arguably the most influential and widely read article in the philosophy of artificial intelligence. Indeed, most of the debate in the philosophy of artificial intelligence over the last fifty years concerns issues that were raised and discussed by Turing. Turing's genius was not only in developing the theory of computability, but also in understanding the impact, both practical and philosophical, that computing machinery would have. Turing believed that computers, if properly designed and educated, could exhibit intelligent behavior. Even behavior that would be indistinguishable from human intelligent behavior. His vision of the possibility of machine intelligence has been highly inspiring and extremely controversial. Exercises five through six, like other medicinal products, vaccines are produced by the biopharmaceutical industry and have to meet the same standards of safety and efficacy as any other drug. All medicines carry some risk, which has to be balanced against the benefits provided. There are particular issues with vaccines, however, since most are designed to provide protection against future infections and are therefore administered to healthy people who have to take the risk of unwanted side effects due to immune system activation. This, along with the relatively low financial returns of vaccines, has discouraged the biopharmaceutical industry from working in this area of drug development. When I joined the industry in the 1980s, working in an immunology department, there was absolutely no interest in developing vaccines. Ironically, I had previously worked in a tumor immunology unit whose long-term aim was to discover how the body uses the immune system to fight cancer. Armed with this knowledge, it might then be possible to vaccinate against the disease. Indeed, a cancer vaccine has recently been introduced for the human papilloma virus (HPV) that causes cervical cancer, and is helping to revive industry enthusiasm for vaccines in general. However, this vaccine is still based on the conventional principle of immunizing healthy individuals to prevent possible infection by the virus in the future. The point of the tumor immunology approach is that it should be possible to develop a therapeutic vaccine to treat the disease itself once it has become established. 
Attempts at producing true cancer vaccines along these lines have been made for many years now, and the work is slowly producing encouraging results. Exercise seven. In the early 1800s, mathematician and physicist Joseph Fourier recognized that as the sun's energy or radiation passes through the atmosphere and strikes the Earth's surface, it heats up the planet. Without the atmosphere, though, the planet would regularly turn frigid. Fourier was the first to recognize that the atmosphere insulates Earth from heat loss, like a blanket. Then, in 1859, scientist John Tyndall discovered something astonishing about one of the trace gases in our atmosphere: carbon dioxide. While the other major components of the atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen, are essentially transparent to long-wave radiation, carbon dioxide is not. Carbon dioxide, along with water vapor, even in small quantities, absorbs long-wave energy, which is stored as heat. Several decades later, Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius went further, suggesting that increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere could alter Earth's surface temperatures. Since that time, observations and experimental evidence have repeatedly confirmed these early discoveries. Exercise eight. Historically, in the United States, prevention hasn't been prioritized, and furthermore, virtually no attention has been paid to fostering a systematic quality prevention approach. For decades, the national prevention model relied primarily on educating people about health and safety risks, hoping they would magically change their behavior. As well intended as educational efforts are, they can never be very effective without simultaneously changing home and community environments, social norms, policies, and institutions. Establishing a broader view beyond brochures, we might say, is critical. Research has shown it is unrealistic to expect that simply warning people about a danger will be sufficient to help them change their long-standing habits or avoid unhealthy exposures on their own. Investment in teens' health, safety, education, and rights empowers them to reach for their dreams and build better lives for themselves and their communities. A quality prevention approach is one in which education is part of a well-designed, sustained, comprehensive effort to broadly improve community environments, social norms, institutional practices, and policies. Exercise nine. Every year, Western countries export millions of tons of waste to China, particularly plastics and paper, for treatment and recycling. It is transported by freight. In empty shipping containers used for exporting Chinese goods, as disposal and landfill prices are high in the West, sending waste overseas, such as to China, is a cheaper option. Another reason is to overcome strict environmental and waste regulations. In some cases, Chinese companies set up offices overseas to buy waste, and they have been able to offer higher prices and accept higher quantities of waste than their counterparts in their origin country. However, the global recycling trade is not without criticism. Complaints include the environmental and social costs of shipping waste, no guarantee over environmental and other standards in China, reduced business and materials for recyclers in the country of origin, and claims that the West is dumping its rubbish on China. It also highlights failures in the recycling market in the West. Recently, China's recycling industry was adversely affected by the global economic crisis, as reduced consumer demand for products led to lower prices of recyclables. Consequently, many Chinese recycling units closed. Exercise ten: The wild flowers of spring are beloved by all who enjoy nature. The color they bring to the landscape after winter's long period of browns, grays, and white makes the heart sing and spirits rise, drawing wildflower lovers into the woods each spring to seek them out. However, by the time summer arrives, we seem to have become accustomed to nature's multi-hued palette, and sadly, the wildflowers of summer tend to get less of our attention. Yet the natural history of summer blooming flowers is every bit as interesting as that of spring wildflowers, 
and in some cases more so because of the greater diversity of insects present during the summer months. The interrelationships between flowers, the insects that visit them, the predators and parasites of those insects, and the animals that disperse their seeds can be even more complex than those involving spring wildflowers. Exercises 11 through 12. Albedo is the fraction of incident solar radiation, sunlight more or less, that gets reflected by the surface of some landscape element, like a tree or a parking lot or a rock or a snowbank. The remainder gets absorbed, warming up the surface. Rock and soil and forests typically have pretty low albedos, meaning they absorb a lot of the sun's heat, and snow and ice have high albedos. That's why you risk snow blindness if you don't wear sunglasses while traversing a glacier or skiing on your local hill, even if it's not an especially sunny day. Your eyes receive not only the sunlight from above, but also the reflected sunlight from below. And that reflected energy is energy that doesn't go toward warming up and melting the ice or snow. In a landscape widely covered by glaciers, the overall albedo is generally high. But say we have a long-term rise in temperature. It might be the result of natural climate changes, like the variations in Earth's orbit that drove the ice ages, for instance, or a human-induced increase in greenhouse gas concentrations, caused by fossil fuel combustion and deforestation associated with population growth and economic expansion. Over time, glaciers start melting away under higher temperatures, the proportion of the landscape covered by ice and snow decreases, and that covered by rock and soil and advancing vegetation increases. Consequently, the albedo of the landscape as a whole goes down, so a greater proportion of the incident sunlight goes to warming the surface of the landscape rather than just being reflected back up. This accelerates the melting and recession of ice sheets, and that in turn further accelerates the reduction in overall albedo and so on. Week 5, Unit 9, Exercise 1 By the beginning of the 20th century, psychology as science had barricaded itself against any liaison with culture. The focus on experimental psychology of lower psychological functions was expected to make psychology a real science. Linkages with history in general, and cultural history in particular, would have been obstacles on the royal road to scientific purity. The result was another century of no serious work on complex cultural phenomena by psychologists. Music, a favorite topic for early psychologists in the 19th and early 20th century, has not been a prominent research field as the discipline enters the 21st century. The story is similar in the case of religion, which in its various forms frames social and personal lives all over the world. It had mostly been abandoned by psychologists as a research field by the 1920s. Nearly a hundred years later, our lives are filled with ever-re-emerging spiritual sentiments that are easily captured by new religious organizations. Exercise 2 in addition to the difficulty we meet when defining bacterial species, their evolution is faster than that of animals and plants, because they have had more time to evolve, existing so much longer. In addition, their generation times are much shorter. The fastest growing animals may produce offspring within days, whereas many bacteria can do so within hours, and some can multiply in less than 10 minutes. A few mutations are likely to occur every once in a while within a population, which by themselves are evolutionarily insignificant, but eventually their accumulation drives the changes necessary to adapt to novel environments, resulting in the development of novel species. The build-up of mutations over generations occurs much faster in bacteria than it does in animals and plants. Even animals and plants living today differ from those that lived in a distant past, so early bacteria must have been quite different from those we know today. Nevertheless, this is often ignored when the bacteria that lived in past eons are considered. 
Lacking specific knowledge about these past inhabitants, we describe them in terminology only fit for present-day bacteria. Exercise three: Despite the protection ants offer, aphids are not always content to stick around. When they want to leave, the next generation grows wings so that they can fly to greener pastures. This doesn't escape the notice of their guardians. And the ants end the aphids' dreams of flight by immediately biting off their transparent appendages, and as if that were not enough, the ants also use chemical means to prevent their domesticated herds from escaping. The ants exude compounds that slow the growth of the aphids' wings, and for good measure, they also slow down the aphids. A research team from Imperial College London discovered that aphids move more slowly when they cross terrain that has previously been walked over by ants. The cause for the slowdown is a chemical message left by the ants that affects the behavior of the aphids and forces them to reduce speed. The beautiful symbiotic relationship between ants and aphids turns out to be not entirely voluntary after all. Although ants protect aphids, they also remove the wings of aphids and emit compounds so that the aphids can't flee, which makes the symbiotic relationship of both parties partly involuntary. Exercise four. Sometimes a filmmaker may purposely strive to evoke a variety of subjective interpretations by developing a film around a riddle or a puzzling quality. The filmmaker attempts to suggest or mystify instead of communicating clearly, and attempts to pose moral or philosophical questions rather than provide answers. The typical reaction to such films is, "What's it all about?" This type of film communicates primarily through symbols or images, so a thorough analysis of these elements will be required for interpretation. After even the most perceptive analysis, a degree of uncertainty will remain. Such films are wide open to subjective interpretation, but the fact that subjective interpretation is required does not mean that the analysis of all film elements can be ignored. Individual interpretation should be supported by an examination of all elements. Exercise five through seven. As a teenager, Pablo worked hard as a shoeshine boy in Piedras Negras, Mexico. Pablo always showed passion for any type of work he did, however modest. People saw the glimmer of hope and ambition in his eye. When Pablo was about fourteen years old, he met Gerald Porras, a missionary who lived near his parents. He would often ask Pablo to run errands for him, in an effort to make a connection with Pablo and teach him English. Pablo shared with Gerald his passion for automotive mechanics and his desire to be successful in the U.S. But the key to success in America, he told Pablo, was to learn English. Pablo wanted to impress him, so he studied English on his own and read countless books. The next thing he knew, Gerald was walking Pablo across the U.S. border to a high school in Eagle Pass, Texas. Crossing the border didn't entail much of a cultural difference. With the exception that the schools expected students to speak English, at this point Pablo was in his late teens and still wasn't proficient in English. It was nerve-wracking then that his first English assignment was to write an essay. Not only was Pablo unfamiliar with the curriculum in general, but he had never written an essay before. He remembers doing the best he could with his limited knowledge of English and turning in his essay. But he received a failing grade. Fortunately, his teacher, also a Latino, did not dismiss the struggling student. Instead, he worked with Pablo until Pablo became proficient in English, eventually earning an A. Pablo was also exceptionally talented in science and math. So, with hard work and perseverance, and a little help from his English teacher, he eventually graduated as valedictorian. Thus, Pablo learned early that in order to be successful, you must also put in the time and effort. He gave much of the credit for his early success to the principal and the teachers at his school in Eagle Pass, and especially to Gerald Porras. Exercise eight: 
The development of advanced brains that can transcend appetitive urges and satisfy more complex demands was motivated by significant evolutionary pressures. The unrestrained pursuit of noticeable stimuli to serve internal urges is not adaptive in a world filled with danger. In addition, the ability to postpone gratification on the basis of context is essential to the development of social groups. For example, the lowest animals in a social hierarchy must wait to eat until more dominant members of the social group are sated. To make such advanced behaviors possible, special circuits evolved to modulate the internal urges and narrow external focus that are induced by the reward system. These circuits, whose major components are located in the prefrontal cortex, promote the pursuit of reward in a manner that is consistent with contextual considerations, learned rules, and a vision of the future. Clinical work with functional brain imaging has defined both the general circuits that drive default brain function and those that support higher levels of complexity and adaptability. Exercise 9 Consider fluctuations in the price of silver. We can suppose that all information on the external influences are contained in the past record of prices, and therefore changes in the future are determined by the past plus stochastic noise. The noise may appear in various ways, but essentially it is constructed from a sequence of independent and statistically identical random events. The complexity stems from the possible coupling between the random variables describing the events and the past price. For example, the price may follow a random walk, but the length of the steps may vary. It can grow if the position fluctuated much in the past, but remain small if the past fluctuations were low. This way, we introduce a kind of positive feedback in the price fluctuations, leading to non-trivial consequences. Exercise 10. A field of planted and weeded crops yields 10 to 100 times as much food, measured in calories, as the same area of naturally occurring plants, a benefit that would have been evident to early crop planters. It also requires more labor, however, which was provided both by the greater number of people in the community and by those people working longer hours. In contrast to the 20 hours a week hunter-gatherers spent on obtaining food, farming peoples were often in the fields from dawn to dusk, particularly during planting and harvest time, but also during the rest of the growing year, because weeding was a constant task. Neolithic farmers were also less healthy than hunter-gatherers were. Although crop raising gave them a more reliable food supply, their narrower range of foodstuffs made them more vulnerable to disease and nutritional deficiencies such as anemia. Farming, compared to hunting and gathering, provided a more abundant food supply for early crop planters at the cost of much more labor for crop management and poorer health caused by less diverse foods. Exercise 11. When discussing medicinal herbs, the news media often quote skeptical doctors who warn that if you fool around with herbs, you're playing with fire. With herbs, they say, it's impossible to guarantee good dose control. Dose control means knowing exactly how much of the active ingredient, the chemical that exerts the healing effect, you're getting per dose. To a certain extent, those skeptics are right. Drugs offer a precise amount of a chemical, usually measured in milligrams. With herbs, potency can vary with the health of the individual plant, how much time the product spent in storage, and other factors. But warnings about dose control obscure a larger truth. When used as recommended by reputable herbalists, medicinal herbs are almost always less potent than their pharmaceutical counterparts. So with most herbal remedies, the risk of overdose is tiny. In fact, it's virtually non-existent, according to the latest research. Exercise 12 through 14 David was a bright, popular 15-year-old boy with excellent verbal skills, but he tended to tune out when a subject focused on visual material, especially symbols. He hated maths, and his teacher, Mr. Paulson, had watched his grades fall steadily over the last year.
Mr. Paulson was an enthusiastic, energetic leader who prided himself on his ability to find a way to connect with his pupils. He didn't enjoy the idea of an able pupil slipping away from him. Mr. Paulson met with David and asked him why he thought his grades were slipping. David said it just didn't make any sense to him, and he was beginning to feel embarrassed because all his mates knew it all, and he never got it. Mr. Paulson noticed that David would tune out about five minutes into every lesson. With important exams on the horizon, Mr. Paulson was beginning to feel hopeless. David's parents contacted him as they were concerned and indicated they wanted his advice and a new plan for the rest of the term. Recalling all he knew about the social brain, Mr. Paulson had an idea. Mr. Paulson was perfectly honest with David about how worried he was and said he was planning something he had never tried before. He asked David if he would help him teach fractions to the year eight students. At first, David was hesitant, fearing that he wouldn't be able to do it, but he knew he could be funny and entertaining, so he agreed cautiously. Mr. Paulson said he wanted David to teach fractions to his granny at home first and use as many jokes and metaphors as he liked to get his ideas across. That went well, and as David was keen to appear smart in front of the younger kids, he prepared well for his teaching responsibility, and it was a huge success. David surprised himself, his teacher, and his friends, and absolutely nailed it. He left the lesson feeling good about himself, and of course, much more confident about maths. Mr. Paulson planned to ask for David's help on future occasions, but in the meantime, David found that teaching a difficult topic like maths to others, including his granny, seemed to tap into a maths superpower, and it boosted his confidence. He had found the secret to improving his grade in maths and a new way for his brain to grow. Week five, unit ten, exercise one. Architecture has always depended on wealthy patrons or the health of the surrounding economy, and some of its current troubles are cyclical. With enough economic growth, building will return, and some architects will work again. But the bust of two thousand eight was not followed by a boom that restored employment or stability. In fact, some of the larger trends, both inside and outside the profession, are discouraging. Among them are government austerity that leads to less high-end designing in the United States and Europe, corporate consolidation that squeezes out innovative small firms, and the diminishing fortunes of a middle class that once drove an important sector of home design. Sorting out which changes are cyclical and which are structural can be difficult while they are happening. What we can say for sure is that six years after the Wall Street crash, many architects are still struggling, and the field and the larger world seem to be changing in ways that will make the profession increasingly inaccessible. Exercise two: Although aquaculture occurs in a controlled environment, cases of escapes, contamination, and spread of disease have been documented, all of which may harm the natural ecosystem in the surrounding area. For example, studies in Chile have shown that escaped salmonoids can colonize their new non-native environment, resulting in resource competition and potentially altering local ecosystem processes. Shrimp production in Asia and other parts of the world has resulted in the deforestation of mangroves and wetlands in order to create space for shrimp ponds. The cultivation of carnivorous fish depends on the extraction of wild fin fish that are converted to meal for fish food. In some parts of the world, this has meant depleted stocks for local fishermen, who will depend on these species for a supplement to their diet or for income. Experts have recently recommended that native herbivorous or filter feeders be farmed, rather than non-native carnivorous species, in order to avoid some of these potential problems. Another suggested solution is to farm exclusively in terrestrial man-made tanks, where all stages of production could be managed, including the disposal of waste. Exercise three: In one experiment, a target individual who refused to complete a racist task was appreciated by neutral judges, 
but disliked by participants who had been asked to complete the racist task prior to the target, and who overwhelmingly did so without complaining. To participants who had willingly gone along with the problematic behavior, the otherwise exemplary stance of the rebel apparently represented a threat to their moral self-guard, which they addressed by putting him or her down, and reporting less respect for and attraction to the rebel. Demonstrating the role of the self-concept, participants whose self-concept had been secured before seeing the rebel. By reflecting on an important quality or value, and how they had recently demonstrated it, did not show the same backlash, even if they had done their racist task first. In fact, participants thus self-affirmed were able to learn from the rebels' gesture. They admitted having had more freedom at the time of the task and reported less comfort with their own choice. Exercise four. The effective use of time is one of the ultimate ways to display authority, even when you don't have it. Whoever controls time controls the situation most instances. They will always remind anyone who wants to meet with them that their time is valuable. However, there may be situations where you will want to reverse your use of tight time tactics. Let's say you have agreed to meet with one of your peers to discuss a difficult situation that has developed. Between your two respective departments, you need more help from your peer than she needs from you to get things resolved. Even though you've told her your time is limited, when she enters your office at the appointed hour, take your watch off ostentatiously and place it face down on your desk. Say, "My time belongs to you for as long as you need it." Watch the cooperation level of your peer go up exponentially at the outset of your meeting. You'll be able to get anything you want from her. Exercises five through seven. It was the day before Anne's wedding, so the house was full of people, all very busy getting things ready for the next day. They were lifting clothes out of boxes and getting them out of cupboards to be ironed and hung up. There were the pretty flowered dresses of the bridesmaids, Anne's lovely wedding dress and veil, Mom's new outfit and hat. And Dad's suit. It was so busy in the house that Dad had gone into the garden to cut the grass and to do a bit of digging. Suddenly, Mom came to the back door and called out, "What trousers have you got on?" "My old green gardening pair, of course," Dad replied. "What do you want to know?" Mom seemed quite worried. "I've got your best suit out of the cupboard, and there's only the jacket on the hanger. No trousers." Do you know where they are? Dad said he had no idea, but he'd come and look. He searched through his cupboard and everyone else's cupboards, but they weren't there. Then other people joined in the search, but it was no good, and soon everyone was worried, except Anne. She was laughing. You'll have to walk me up the church aisle in your best jacket and your old green gardening trousers, Dad. She said. Then everyone will remember my wedding. Soon everyone was laughing and thinking of the unwedding things they could wear, their aprons or their crash helmets. Just then the doorbell rang and Mom opened the door. Anne's grandpa, a retired tailor, was standing there with Dad's best trousers hanging over his arm. He was surprised to find them all laughing, and even more surprised when they all shouted. Hooray! The trousers are here. Grandpa explained that he'd noticed a button that was loose when Dad had last worn them, and he'd taken the trousers home to sew the button on properly. Then he'd forgotten to bring them back. How pleased everyone was! Anne gave Dad a hug. I'm glad we found your trousers, she said. But it's you I want at my wedding, and I really wouldn't mind what you wore. Even those old green gardening trousers. Exercise eight. In pluralistic societies, ethnic minorities and indigenous groups sometimes ask the legal system to take their cultural background into account in criminal and civil cases. Most individuals, when first hearing of the cultural defense, immediately reject it for fear that it would lead to anarchy. 
If each person could demand exemptions from the law, then the law would be powerless to hold society together. Ethnic minorities should change their behavior so it conforms to the law of the land. When in Rome, do as the Romans do has been the conventional wisdom for centuries. The official policies of essentially all nation states mirror these beliefs. Indeed, most governments favor assimilation over the accommodation of cultural differences. This view, which is widely accepted by the public and government elites, has complicated efforts to raise cultural defenses in many instances. Exercise nine: Individuals who score high on conscientiousness are particularly likely to satisfy traditional definitions of success. They perform better in academic pursuits. And in measures of occupational achievement, than those who are low in conscientiousness, it should be noted, though, that these successes are most frequently found in courses and careers that stress conventional problem solving, while those who are high in openness excel at tasks that involve coming up with original ways of doing things. Highly conscientious people are punctual and persevering; they can focus intently on the activities in front of them. This laser focus, however, might work better in some fields than others. For example, Robert and Janice Hogan, pioneers in the study of personality and organizations, devised the study in which jazz musicians rated their fellow musicians on how good they were as performers. Those who scored high in conscientiousness were rated by their peers as less effective. Perhaps this is because musicians who intensely concentrate on their playing may be inhibiting the spontaneity crucial to improvisational jazz. Exercise ten: A possible explanation for the value of writing is that it allows people to express themselves. If the driving process is self-expression, one could argue that both verbal and non-verbal forms of expression would provide comparable benefits. It should be noted, however, that traditional research on the venting of emotions has failed to support the clinical value of emotional expression in the absence of cognitive processing. A recent experiment by Ann Krantz and James W. Penbaker sought to learn if the disclosure of a trauma through dance or bodily movement would bring about health improvements in ways comparable to writing. In the study, students were asked to express a traumatic experience using bodily movement, to express an experience using movement, and then write about it, or to exercise in a prescribed manner for three days, ten minutes per day. Whereas the two movement expression groups reported that they felt happier and mentally healthier in the months after the study, only the movement plus right group evidenced significant improvements in physical health. And grade point average. Exercise eleven. Increased individualism has produced norms of greater autonomy between the generations, and social protection schemes have contributed towards residential and financial independence between the generations. The separation between public and private life is a cogent characteristic of individualistic contemporary societies. Faced with increased uncertainty, the symbol of modernity, individuals tend to retreat to the cocoon of family and friends. The modern family has entered into the sphere of intimacy, and has become a central place for the construction of personal identity. However, these changes have not reduced the ties between the state and the family. On the contrary, the link between them has been redefined with a deeper interdependence emerging. This interdependence is manifest in legal structures and through the welfare state. Exercises twelve through fourteen. Matt was teaching dance at a boarding school for emotionally disturbed children. Their average attention span may have been fifteen seconds. One young boy, an eleven-year-old, was an exception. His concentration was intense for the thirty-five minutes of the dance class. At the end of class, Matt said to him, "You're great. What's your name?" One of the supervisors of the school rushed over to him and said, "Oh, his name is Michael. He's very intelligent, but he doesn't speak." In the following weeks of dance class, he built choreography for Michael and his classmates. 
In the spring, they were scheduled to dance in the event of the year. Matt used Michael as the leader and invented an energetic dance to utilize his students' explosive energy. All throughout the practice, Michael never spoke. That spring, dancers from 22 different schools came together for the event of the year. The biggest challenge was how to get 2,000 dancing children on stage for the opening number. For this, a system has been developed called the runs. The stage is divided with colored lines of box shapes on the stage floor. At the end of the overture, the dancers burst onto the stage, running to their allotted boxes, where they explode into the opening dance number. On Matt's cue, the runs began. After about a minute, he realized something was wrong. On stage left, Children were colliding into each other behind some obstacle. He ran over to discover the source of the problem Michael and his classmates. Michael was dancing energetically, but he was blocking other dancers trying to get through. Matt rushed up to them and he yelled, You're in the wrong place, back up. Michael, with his eyes blazing and legs and arms spinning in dance movements, yelled out, Oh, I am so happy. Oh, it's so good. Matt backed off, stunned into silence. He sat down in the first row of the audience with several of the supervisors and teachers, their mouths open in wonder. No one danced better or with more passion in the whole show that night than Michael. Week 6, Unit 11. Exercise 1. Historically, children have sought greater freedom to choose how they spend their time and who they spend it with as they grow older. Initially, parents are cautious in the concessions they make in response to such demands. They may often take a step by step approach of allowing a certain amount of freedom to test the waters in terms of whether their child can use it responsibly or whether they abuse such privilege and run into trouble. As children enter their teen years and become physically more mature, they begin to make greater freedom demands, and parents must then make judgment calls about how far to relax earlier controls over their child's behavior. Ultimately, concessions must be made not just to alleviate domestic tensions, but also to allow their offspring to gain greater experience of self reliance in the wider world. Against this background, the mobile phone has become a tool that parents and children can use to meet their separate needs in this complex social dynamic. Exercise 2 The importance of the retail sector to the global economy is particularly evident during times of crisis. World leaders, faced with a severe economic downturn, look to consumers for help. After 9 11, U.S. President Bush asked Americans to carry on with their lives, not to lose confidence, and to continue spending. Leaders made similar requests in response to the recent global recession, because when consumers stop buying, the economy grinds to a halt. In contrast, when consumers are confident and spending freely, money flows through retail stores. Up the supply chain and all the way back to the manufacturers, farmers, and other producers, making stops along the way with lawyers, bankers, and other service firms. Meanwhile, governments pick up their share through corporate, land, income, and consumption taxes. Consumers are at the heart of all this economic activity. Exercise 3 People use self presentation to advance their claims to identity. In some studies, participants were made to feel either secure or insecure about their claims. For example, among participants who aspired to become expert guitarists, some were told that their personality profiles differed markedly from those of expert guitarists, which conveyed the message that the participant was not on his or her way to becoming one of those experts. Others were told that they fit the profile precisely. Which made them feel as if they were doing well on their project of becoming an expert guitarist. They were then asked whether they would like to give guitar lessons to beginners, and if so, how many.
The people who had been made to feel insecure about their claims to becoming expert guitarists wanted to teach many more lessons than the people who were told they were already looking like expert guitarists. The insecure ones wanted to strengthen their claims to being a guitarist by teaching guitar to others, because these others would view them as good guitarists. Some studies suggest that those who are judged to lack the qualities of an expert they want to become apply self-presentation to reinforce their identity claims. Exercise four: The history of life on Earth shows that when new needs arise, evolution accommodates them by creating new structures. In the primeval Earth, single-celled creatures joined up to become multi-celled ones, surrendering independence in exchange for collective power. CO2-breathing plants cooperated with O2-breathing animals to create a new biosphere in which each could evolve all the faster. Predators invented better ways to hunt, so prey invented better defenses, which forced predators to innovate yet again. When humans appeared, the process picked up speed, with each cycle taking place in centuries rather than millennia. Plows led to better harvests, which gave people leisure time to invent better plows. Telegraphs let newspapers go national, which created a demand for better journalistic tools such as teletypewriters. New computer chips let electrical engineers create even faster chips. Each push triggers a pull. Which sets the stage for another push. Exercise five through seven. During the time of King Hussein Kurt, there lived a person by the name of Malana Arshadi, who was well known for his poverty and beggary. However, he possessed a beautiful voice, by means of which he would move the hearts of the people. When Hussein Kurt desired to send a messenger to King Shuja of Shiraz to convey his message to him, the people suggested, "The speech of Maulana Arshadi, the beggar, is excellent." King Hussein summoned him and said, "I intend to send you upon an important mission. The only flaw that you possess is that you beg. However, I am willing to send you to Shiraz if you promise not to bring my name into disrepute by begging there." Saying this, he gave him twenty thousand dinars. On his part, Malani Arshadi promised that he would not beg in Shiraz. Preparations were made for the journey. The money was handed over to him, and he eventually set out for Shiraz. Reaching there, he was given the reply for the message that he had from King Hussein. However, when he desired to return, King Shuja and the members of his administration expressed their desire to hear some sermon in his voice. It was decided that he would preach in the mosque after the Friday prayers. People, as well as the members of the king's administration, had gathered in the mosque to hear him speak. On Friday, as he began to speak, it was not long before he had captivated everyone by his voice. Observing this, his trait of beggary stimulated his greed, and so, unable to restrain himself, he said, "I have promised not to speak of my poverty and beggary. However." From the time I have entered your city, I have not witnessed any charity from your side. Is it that all of you have given your word not to give me any alms? Hearing this, the people burst out in laughter and then proceeded to give him so much money that he was left pleased and satisfied. Exercise eight. Self-monitoring is a process of being aware of yourself and how you are coming across to others. It involves being sensitive to other people's expressions and reactions, and using this information in deciding how to act and what roles to play. In other words, it is a process of observing, analyzing, and regulating your own behavior in relation to the response of others. Self-monitoring is an internal thought process, so others probably don't know that you are monitoring and making choices about how to act. Think of the times when you consciously monitored how you were coming across in a situation. If you have ever been in an unfamiliar situation and made a flip remark that was met with stares or glares, you may have said to yourself, "Wow, that was a stupid thing to say. Let me see if I can fix it." Then, based on this self-monitoring, you are able to make a repair. Exercise nine. 
Ancient people explained their world using stories known as myths. The Bakuba people of Central Africa thought the world was formed when a giant was sick. The ancient Romans believed that storms and earthquakes were caused when Neptune, the god of the sea, was angry. Then, from about 2,500 years ago, Greek philosophers such as Thales of Miletus and Aristotle began to question the workings of the universe based on what they could see around them. They were the first people in recorded history to think as scientists, building knowledge by observing natural phenomena. Thinkers made new discoveries and developed new theories in other parts of the ancient world too, including Egypt, India, and China. Although some of the ideas of these pioneers were later proved wrong, their revolutionary ways of thinking laid the foundations of modern science. Exercise ten: Violent and discriminatory conduct must be swiftly punished, and speech conveying discriminatory, hateful ideas should be strongly contradicted. But punishing ideas we consider hateful or discriminatory not only violates the fundamental free speech principles; it also may well increase intergroup distrust and discrimination rather than reducing them. Evidence suggests that none of us is immune from implicit or unconscious biases that pervade our society, with its entrenched structural discrimination. Therefore, speech that reflects discriminatory stereotypes can often result from ignorance or insensitivity rather than malevolence. Of course, we must vigorously combat bias, including the unintended variety. But the tools for doing so should be adjusted appropriately. Someone who negligently conveys stereotyped views is likely to respond more positively to constructive educational outreach than to accusations of and punishment for hate speech. Indeed, even for people who consciously harbor and express hateful views, educational strategies are more promising than censorship for altering such views and curbing their influence. We should put up a vigorous fight against discriminatory ideas through educational efforts, which will likely produce a positive response from those who use hate speech, regardless of whether they intentionally express their views. Exercise eleven: A motivation for incorporating technology into music instruction could be cultural rather than pedagogical. As a field, education is inherently slow to change. Before becoming a teacher, a person will have been deeply socialized in the educational process for 17 years or more by his or her experiences as a student. After all of these years of observing teachers, we tend to teach as we were taught. Although this can be beneficial when good teaching practice is transmitted forward through the generations, it can also be a drawback when new approaches are left untapped. Previous generations of music teachers did not use computers and digital technologies, not because they chose not to, but simply because the technology was not available. Not only is it a professional educator's responsibility to explore the pedagogical benefits of new technologies, but it is also important that instruction remains current and connected to society. A music classroom that has no technology runs the risk of appearing to parents and administrators as not being relevant to the musical practices of society, or even worse, actually being disconnected from the experiences of the students. Exercise twelve through fourteen. Marian Anderson was born into a typical black home in the eighteen nineties when she was six years old. Anderson started singing in the choir of the Union Baptist Church in Philadelphia. It didn't take long for audiences to recognize her incredible contralto voice. By the time she was sixteen, Anderson was singing on stages in New York City. She soon accepted invitations to perform in Europe. There, the promoters of concerts and operas were anxious to display her talents. In America, however, few promoters were willing to let Anderson onto their stages. In 1939, theatrical producer Saul Hurok heard Anderson perform in Paris and decided that her beautiful voice would appeal to Americans, regardless of her race. He booked Anderson on a nationwide tour of America's great halls. 
In Washington D.C., the nation's capital, she was booked to perform in the 2,000-seat auditorium of Constitution Hall. This is the headquarters of the Daughters of the American Revolution (DAR), an organization of women whose ancestors had fought in America's War for Independence. But as the date of the concert drew near, Anderson was told that the DAR would not allow her to perform in Constitution Hall. That no coloreds were permitted on the stage. Word of the DAR's decision to bar Anderson from Constitution Hall spread quickly through Washington. When Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady, learned of the DAR's action, she was outraged. She was a member of the DAR herself, but decided that she could no longer belong to an organization that would show a bias against race, and so she resigned from the group. Mrs. Roosevelt urged Interior Secretary Harold L. Ikes to permit Anderson to give a concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. On April ninth, nineteen thirty-nine, Easter Sunday, seventy-five thousand people gathered to attend a free concert performed by Marian Anderson. The singer stepped onto the stage that had been erected on the Lincoln Memorial steps, taking her place behind a battery of microphones that would broadcast the concert to a national radio audience of millions. She closed her eyes and sang the words, "My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty." Marian Anderson had chosen to sing "America." Week six, Unit Twelve, Exercise One. Emerging adulthood is an exploratory age during which young people make decisions that have long-lasting effects on their life chances. Major social and economic restructuring over the last several decades contributes to the precariousness of long-term employment, a collective sense of insecurity in social positions, and greater economic churning or turnover in adult transitions. To put those trends in more concrete terms, first. Prior generations were able to earn more money at earlier ages, relative to inflated costs. Second, those generations were better able to keep the same job and work their way up within a company. Now, young people change jobs more frequently. Third, only a small minority of emerging adults view their current job as a viable long-term career. Meaning, it takes longer now to secure positions than reliably pay the rent or mortgage. Fourth, the skills required for top positions in an increasingly technological society require greater levels of cognitive capacities, which have continually increased the demands for higher education. College degrees and often advanced degrees are required more often for entry-level positions now than for previous generations. Exercise two: The negative health effects of lead, particularly on children, have been known for centuries. Nonetheless, lead was added to gasoline and paint in the United States in the early 1900s, spreading it through homes and roadsides. Since lead was banned in the 1970s, population-wide blood lead levels have declined sharply. However, children living in older housing in poor repair continue to be poisoned at alarming rates. In 1999, an elementary school principal in Rochester, New York, discovered that 41 percent of his incoming students had elevated blood lead levels, 20 times the national rate. This striking disparity caused diverse stakeholders, including researchers, lawyers, health officials, city officials, educators, and child advocates, to work together to prevent lead poisoning. The resulting coalition improved health and housing agency coordination, developed a comprehensive communications campaign, and passed a groundbreaking city lead law in 2005. By 2012, the number of Rochester children with elevated lead levels had decreased over 90 percent, 2.4 times faster than in similar upstate New York cities. Exercise three. Amos Zahavi has suggested that all signals are an honest reflection of an individual's quality, because it should not pay receivers to attend to dishonest signals. These would become ignored, and only honest signals would prevail. Zahavi argued that honest signals are maintained because they are costly in terms of strategic costs, such that only a genuinely good individual can afford to make the signal. Consider tail length in birds and mate choice. 
Females may prefer males with longer tails, and only the fittest males can produce and maintain such tails, because only they have the quality to cope with the costs that this incurs: increased risk of predation, loss of flight efficiency, and so on. Because the signal is costly, only the fittest individual can produce and maintain such a signal while coping with the costs, and tail length becomes an honest signal of quality. According to Zahavi, because animal signals are costly, guaranteeing their honesty, the burden of such display, like longer tails, demonstrates the biological strength of the signaler. Exercise four. A category of special interest to the serious student encompasses social problem films, which are difficult to evaluate, for their aging can occur very rapidly. A film can become not only dated but completely irrelevant within society in just a few years. This happens when the problem attacked by the film is eliminated or corrected. In a sense, the social problem film can enjoy a long life only by failing in its purpose. For its impact is generally lost as soon as the problem portrayed no longer exists. This is especially true of a film that treats a narrow, topical, and very contemporary problem. The more general the problem, the more widespread its effects, and the more resistant it is to reform. The longer is the lifespan of the social problem film directed against it. As long as the social problem exists, the film has relevance. Exercises five through seven. Melody, who had at some point sustained a brain injury, became seven years old and ready for her first public school in September 1969. The back-to-school sales had drawn me to my sewing machine with blue plaid material to match the eyes of both my daughters. They would both have a new dress for the occasion of Melody's first day at Pinkard Court School. The day was warm and sunny, with the Blue Ridge Mountains displaying lovely fall colors. I told Melody that her teacher, Mrs. Williams, had called the night before, and that she would have a desk near the teacher's desk. During the ride along busy streets to the school, Melody seemed to especially want her sister Wendy to stay with her for a while after we arrived. I assured her that Wendy and I would both stay to meet everyone and learn what Melody would be doing there. She gave us both a big grin of satisfaction when she was told this. When we arrived at the school, Wendy was quick to unfasten the belt on her car seat. Bouncy, three-year-old, and full of energy, she was anxious to leap out of the car. I held the hands of both girls as we walked toward the entrance. Wendy was often five steps ahead of Melody and me. Melody's teacher, Mrs. Williams, met us at the office with a warm embrace. In her soft, gentle voice, she welcomed us and showed Melody her desk. She went on to tell Melody that she had heard about her love of music. She would have Mrs. Harris, her music teacher, there twice a week, and would do a lot of music in the class. As the weeks went by, it became clear that Melody had made a beautiful transition to her new school. Mrs. Williams recognized and appreciated Melody's efforts to work as hard as she could. Although colors, shapes, and numbers continued to elude her little mind, she consistently paid attention, listening and trying her best. Melody loved school and especially her music teacher. And it was agreed right from the start that Melody would be treated just like every other student. This worked wonderfully well for everyone concerned. Exercise eight: If a group's circumstances are threatened or difficult, many of the members of that group will be angry, and they will want to blame someone. Whenever a threat looms or a terrible event has occurred, rumors are inevitable. Most people are not able to know, on the basis of personal or direct knowledge, why a terrorist attack succeeded, or why the economy suddenly got worse. In the aftermath of a crisis, numerous speculations will be offered. To some people, those speculations will seem likely to be true, perhaps because they provide a suitable outlet for outrage and blame. Terrible events produce outrage. When people are outraged, they are all the more likely to accept rumors that justify their emotional states, 
and also to attribute those events to intentional action. Some rumors simultaneously relieve a primary emotional urge and offer an explanation to those who accept them of why they feel as they do. The rumor rationalizes while it relieves. And when conditions are unstable, people may be especially likely to accept a rumor about the self-serving or invidious plans of influential people. Exercise nine: Why is it necessary to isolate and control extraneous variables and manipulate the independent variable to maximize internal validity? To answer this question, consider a study of the influence of television advertising on voting preferences. Assume we were not interested in the effects of education, religion, and parents' political preferences, or any other independent variables on voters' choices. All we wanted to know was whether seeing a particular television advertisement influenced voting preferences. Now suppose we did not manipulate who watched the television advertisement and who did not. Suppose that instead we simply found some individuals who saw the advertisement and some who did not, and we asked them about their preferred candidate. If we found a difference in candidate preferences between those who saw the advertisement and those who did not, we could never be sure that this difference was due to having watched the advertisement or not. Instead, it might be due to a host of other individual difference variables on which the two groups happen to differ, such as political views or education. Exercise ten: By 2030, most cars will be completely or partially driverless, depending on the rate of unmanned technology adoption. This means that by then, the special relationship that bonds fast car owners with their vehicle will have totally disappeared for a simple reason: car performance directly associated with acceleration and speed will have definitely vanished from a driverless environment, and with it, the values associated with fast or powerful cars. Furthermore, speed will most likely be automatically monitored or controlled, taking away some of the risks, but also the feeling of freedom that drivers still enjoy. Then safety will remain a strong selling feature. Comfort and more generally the traveling experience will become increasingly important. What is interesting to note is that when we look more carefully to these key selling features, they look strangely like values that a bus or train operator is promoting. This is to say that more and more the difference between public and private transport will shrink. A driverless car is likely to eliminate the control which car owners have over their car performance related to speed, making private transport more similar to public transport. Exercise eleven: Competition with other species for fruit and nuts is likely to have been intense. Principally, because humans were gathering rather than eating in situ, and would have wished to collect large quantities in order to share and/or store part of the harvest, the greater intelligence of humans would have allowed analysis of competition and the formation of resource defense strategies. For large crops of desirable fruit or nuts, it seems likely that humans would have invented ways of reducing feeding competition. Barriers, fire, and noise may have been sufficient to deter primates, but pit traps and snares may have been used to reinforce defenses. For omnivorous humans, a concentration of desirable fruit was not only a resource but also bait that could be exploited to attract meat. Thus, forest-dwelling humans may have evolved trapping skills to simultaneously protect shared plant foods and acquire animal foods. The ultimate in exclusion competition is to have your cake and eat it too. Exercises twelve through fourteen. It was a busy day in the market. A variety of wares were being sold, and the market was bustling with activity. A man was looking for a good horse to buy. He frequently had to travel across kingdoms for his business, and he was looking for a sturdy, well-bred horse. That could move swiftly and untiringly across long distances. He went to the section of the market where horses and other animals were being bartered or sold. He approached one horse seller and then another, but was not satisfied. The third horse seller was a wrinkled old man. He had only one horse tied by his side, 
and appeared to be a magnificent horse. The man asked the old horse seller for the price of the horse. He quoted a price that was extremely high. The man was shocked. Even a horse made of gold and diamonds would not cost so much, he said. Ah, but my horse is very clever, the old man explained. When the rider falls down, the horse will find the way and carry him to the nearest hospital. The man was impressed. He decided to buy the horse in spite of the high rate the seller demanded. A month went by. It was market day again. The old horse seller was standing in his usual place when a man came rushing to him. You cheated me, the man shouted angrily. Last month you sold me a horse that you said was clever enough to take the rider to the hospital in case of an accident. Did the horse do nothing when you had an accident? the old man asked. Well, it did carry me away from the scene of the accident, the man replied, but to a veterinary hospital. The old man smiled. That shows that I did not cheat you. It did carry you to a hospital, he replied. Of what use is it to a human being to be taken to a veterinary hospital? the man demanded. Ah, but the human being should have thought about that before he bought the horse. It is an animal. The only hospital it has ever been to is a veterinary hospital. How could you even expect that a horse would take you to a hospital for human beings? the man replied. Week 7. Mini Test 1. Number 1. Dear Mr. Simpson, I am writing with regards to the catering services you offered on January 4th for our dinner event. You are aware that over 20 of our guests suffered food poisoning caused directly by the food you provided. Furthermore, your staff were unprofessional and clearly had not been properly trained for this type of work. The waiters were rude and disorderly, while the kitchen staff were dirty in appearance and did not wear the correct clothing specified in government regulations relating to hygiene and public catering. To make matters worse, you presented a bill which was way over the agreed price and told me to pay immediately. In these circumstances, I think my refusal was quite reasonable. Having taken all of the above into consideration, I have spoken with our attorneys and have decided to take the necessary legal action to solve this matter. You will be hearing from them in due course. Sincerely, Mark Haley. Number 2. One Friday night, I walked into a thrift shop, the type of place that has always attracted me. A brilliant red-colored hat immediately caught my eye, but I didn't need it. I had nowhere to wear it. There was no good reason to buy it. It would be an unnecessary expenditure. Surely that eight dollars could be put to better use. Obviously, I thought, I should turn around, walk out of this thrift shop, and put that hat out of my mind. On the other hand, I was feeling light-hearted. The little girl inside of me, who had barely managed to survive, isolated in the closet, so to speak, for years, was begging me to buy it. I found myself standing in front of the cash register, digging into my wallet. Before I knew it, that bright red hat was perched on my head. As far as I know, I didn't surprise anyone on the street. The sky did not fall. The only real result was that I experienced some moments of genuine pleasure. Number 3. Some people graduate from college with the mindset of daring adventurers. This is the time for fun before real life settles in. Marriage and a real job will just arrive in the mail one day when they are 35. In the meantime, they're going to have experiences. These are the people who at age 23 go teach English in Mongolia or lead whitewater rafting trips in Colorado. This daring course has real advantages. Your first job out of college is probably going to be a mess anyway, so, as the impact investor Blair Miller advises, you might as well use this period to widen your horizon of risk. If you do something completely crazy, you will know forever after that you can handle a certain amount of risk, and your approach to life for all the decades hence will be more courageous. Number 4. One memorable day, Bill Boomer addressed a coach's clinic I happened to be attending. Speaker after speaker had gone on and on about how they trained their swimmers by building the engine and fuel tank, so to speak. 
throwing enough hard work at them that their bodies had no choice but to build endurance. Then Boomer took the podium and dropped his bomb. He posed an obvious question, but one I'd never heard in two decades of attending such meetings. How can we teach people to swim at any given speed with less effort? His answer was just as disarming, by reshaping the vessel. After all, swimmers had a lot in common with boats, and like a naval architect, Boomer knew there were ways to improve the efficiency of their hull designs. Apparently, he had the advantage of fresh eyes, since he hadn't even been a swimmer himself, studying movement science in school and coaching soccer and track. So Boomer came to swimming, minus the usual baggage of how things ought to be done, and with a deep understanding of the way the human body moves. That enabled him to see things the rest of us had missed. Number five. A good way to understand the story invention process is to observe it firsthand. Unfortunately, when people create a new story, we have difficulty knowing exactly how they found the various pieces of the story they are telling. We cannot easily know what has been invented out of thin air and what has been adapted from prior experiences or other stories. We can reasonably assume, however, that true creation can hardly exist with respect to stories. Every story we tell has to have its basis in something that we have already experienced. Of course, the better we are at telling stories, the better we are at giving them the appearance of being complete fiction. This can mean that even we as tellers see the story as fictional, not realizing the adaptation process that we ourselves have used. Even stories that are pure fantasy. Our adaptations of more realistic stories, where certain constraints of the real world are relaxed. Number six. Many European citizens feel that their national culture is threatened by moves towards economic and political unification. Some cultural communities in Europe, however, welcome this trend, since their particular identities have not always been respected by nation states. We are strongly encouraged to preserve the variety of cultures in Europe, whilst at the same time urged to recognize commonalities, collaborate, integrate, and unify for the common good. Is this a paradox? Can we preserve our identification with local, regional, or national cultures whilst still embracing European integration? The idea of any local, regional, or national culture as an isolated, unassailable entity is simply untenable today in a continent with such excellent communications. Also, historically, no region can claim cultural or ethnic purity. All European cultures have been ready to take on Goethe's foreign treasures to adapt and refine them before passing them on again. Number seven. For obvious reasons, most of the experimental work on the neural basis of aggressive behavior has been done on animals, and one must be careful about generalizing data obtained from animal research to humans. However, the evidence clearly supports the proposition that man's evolution has not eliminated his neural systems for aggression. A number of cases demonstrating aggression as a result of the activation of particular neural systems are presented in *Violence and the Brain* by Vernon H. Mark and Frank R. Irvin. The now classic case reported by King in 1961 can be used as an example. A mild-mannered female patient became aggressive, verbally hostile, and threatened to strike the experimenter when she was electrically stimulated in the region of the amygdala. When the current was turned off, her mild manner returned, and she became apologetic for her behavior. She did not report a sensation of pain, but indicated that it was unpleasant to feel so hostile. This patient's hostile feelings and behavior could be activated and deactivated simply by throwing the switch. Number eight. Familiarity with the work of medical doctors and medical researchers. U.S. 2019. The graph above shows American adults' familiarity with the work of medical doctors and medical researchers in 
while less than 50 percent of American adults said they knew a little about what medical doctors do, about two thirds said they knew a little about the work of medical researchers. News was the most common source of information about these specialties, with almost the same percentage of American adults saying they were familiar with what medical doctors or medical researchers do from the news, at 69 percent and 70 percent respectively. Less than half of American adults reported they learned about the work of both medical professionals in school. More than 60 percent of American adults said they were aware of what medical doctors do through knowing a medical professional personally, and far more adults said they were familiar with the work of medical researchers through a personal relationship. American adults also answered that they learned about what medical doctors and researchers do in their job, but the percentages were respectively smallest of all the four categories of answers. Number nine. Isabella Beaton was born in London to Benjamin Mason, a shopkeeper, and his wife Elizabeth. She was educated by her parents and later attended school in Heidelberg, Germany. In 1856, Isabella married Samuel Orchard Beaton, a successful publisher who specialized in practical non-fiction books, issuing such titles as Beaton's Book of Garden Management and Beaton's Book of Home Pets. He also published a widely circulated periodical called the English Woman's Domestic Magazine, for which Isabella began to write on a variety of subjects, especially fashion. In 1861, Isabella Beaton published Beaton's Book of Household Management, parts of which had originally appeared in her husband's magazine. Her book was the first comprehensive guide on how to manage a home. Including advice on hiring servants, housekeeping tips, and recipes. By 1868, it had sold more than two million copies. Explaining her reason for writing the book, Beaton said, "What moved me in the first instance to attempt a work like this was the discomfort and suffering which I had seen brought upon men and women by household mismanagement." Number ten, Missouri Journalism Workshop. Saturday, July 10th to Friday, July 16th, Missouri School of Journalism (MSJ). Join MSJ's prestigious journalism workshop to learn how to cover issues, news, and current events in an inclusive way by prominent journalism academics from the Missouri School of Journalism and industry professionals. At the end of the workshop, some of your stories will be published on the MSJ website. Cost. Six hundred seventy-five dollars includes all workshop activities, two meals per day in a campus dining facility, and local transportation. Main workshop themes and activities: mobile technologies. Learn how to interview sources, shoot video, take photos. Do everything you need to produce a story while you're on location. Documentary journalism. Go beyond daily news reporting and be exposed to long-form storytelling. You'll learn new investigative and technical skills in this activity. Data journalism: dig deep into publicly available information in government databases to discover useful facts and statistics. Learn how to produce graphics that visualize information. Register today. Register on the MSJ website by paying a $25 non-refundable registration fee by April 28th. For more information, email at msj@missouri.edu or call 573-882-6031. Number 11, the Vroom battery-powered car for kids. Your child will absolutely love it. Technical specifications: max speed, 2.5 kilometers per hour. Functions: forward, backward, stop, horn sound, and engine sound. Weight capacity: 25 kilograms. Battery type: 6 volt rechargeable battery. Charge time: 8 to 12 hours after each use. Battery lifetime: approximately 300 hours. Recommended ages. Three to five years. General information: Vehicle should be assembled by an adult. To avoid injury, do not allow children to play with the small parts. 
children should always be supervised by an adult when operating the car. Only one child should ride at a time. Use the car only on flat surfaces such as indoors, in garages, or on sidewalks. Unplug the car charger when cleaning. Recharge the battery after each use to extend battery life. If the car hasn't been used for 30 days, the battery must be charged. Number 12. A helpful way to create a school in which the faculty works together as a team is to think of employees as volunteers. With volunteers, supervisors cannot rely on hierarchical, legitimate power to gain compliance and cooperation, but must, instead, use powers of persuasion and relationship. In our desire to make a task interesting so that a volunteer will give her time to work on it, we must begin by knowing and understanding the volunteer. For example, what are her interests? What are her talents? What can we do to encourage her to give her time and energy to the task? We must listen to her. Working with employees, people who receive a paycheck, should be no different. We need to listen to them, too. We need to understand their interests and talents and learn what we can do to encourage them to give time and energy to us. Number 13. Children's limited life experience and their level of intellectual development mean that the messages they receive about appearance are very powerful. Children often do not have the understanding or confidence to disregard the constant media pressure they receive to achieve a particular look. Parents can encourage their children through their own example to notice the relentless media pressure to look a certain way. The adults can begin discussions at home whilst watching television with their children or looking through magazines about the images they see all around them and the messages these convey about physical attractiveness. They need to foster a questioning, challenging approach to society's rigid ideals of thinness and beauty. Through example, they can show children how to question and criticize the media images that are presented. This will moderate the effect of media pressure and help their children to become more critically aware of the messages they receive. Number 14. Many persons are uncertain about how to regard themselves. They are not certain of their abilities, their social stimulus value, or their worth. For these persons, their self-evaluations constitute opinions about which they are concerned and in need of social support. Accordingly, we would expect to find the formation of interpersonal relationships to be facilitated when two individuals hold opinions of each other that are similar to their respective self-evaluations. This creates a situation in which each can reward the other by expressing opinions that validate the accuracy of the other's self-image. Further, assuming that people generally have predominantly positive attitudes about themselves, relationship formation would be facilitated by their having positive evaluations of each other. Put in everyday terms, this assertion is that a friendship is made more likely if the two persons can honestly say nice things about each other. In the strategies of how to win friends and influence people, this suggests the importance of praise and flattery. Number 15. The most effective and innovative teams have regular, intense debates, which has been fun for us to observe. The ability to disagree without causing offense is essential to robust communication and problem-solving within teams. Yet when we pose the question to groups of leaders what's better, a team that's almost always harmonious or one that has conflicts and arguments, the vast majority vote for a team with no disharmony. The irony is that teammates want the opportunity to challenge each other. As long as discussions are respectful and everyone gets the chance to contribute equally, most people thrive on this kind of debate, finding it not only intellectually stimulating, but important to getting to the root of problems and working out optimal solutions. Teams feel more bonded and more effective when they regularly engage in challenging discussions, when members are encouraged to argue with one another's ideas and perspectives. It's also true even if the debates get a little heated. Number 16. Indeed, the simple attributes of urbanism are typically a more cost-efficient environmental strategy than many renewable technologies. 
For example, in many climates, a party wall is more cost-effective than a solar collector in reducing a home's heating needs. Well-placed windows and high ceilings offer better lighting than efficient fluorescence in the office. A walk or a bike ride is certainly less expensive and less carbon-intensive than a hybrid car, even at 50 miles per gallon. A convenient transit line is a better investment than a smart highway system. A small co-generating electrical plant that reuses its waste heat locally could save more carbon per dollar invested than a distant wind farm. A combination of urbanism and green technology will be necessary, but the efficiency of urbanism should precede the costs of alternate technologies. As Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute famously advocates, a megawatt of conservation is always more cost-effective than a watt of new energy, renewable or not. Urban living, in its many forms, turns out to be the best type of conservation. Number 17. Pocahontas, a legendary figure in American history, was just a pre-adolescent when she challenged two cultures at odds to cooperate instead of to compete. While Pocahontas forged peace, many more now-forgotten Native American, Anglo-American, African-American, and other children contributed to their family's survival, community's development, and America's history in just as legitimate, though perhaps less legendary, ways. Contracts and correspondence from colonial Chesapeake reveal that even 17th-century toddlers labored. But the historical agency of the vast majority of children and adolescents has been undervalued and overlooked in dominant historical narratives. Instead, generations of Americans have credited fathers and other hoary leaders for their actions and achievements, all the while disregarding essential boyhood experiences that shaped skills and ideals. Reflecting these androcentric, eurocentric, and age-based biases that have framed the nation's history, American history texts have reinforced the historical invisibility of girls and boys for centuries. For students searching libraries for scholarly sources and primary documents about children and adolescents in various historical contexts, this near absence of information in master narratives has frustrated their research. Number 18. Wherever women are dominant carriers of domestic responsibilities and are employed outside the home, we talk about the double burden syndrome, a syndrome deriving from the combined strains produced by wage work, household duties, and motherhood in an economy of shortage. This often results in women's reluctance to work overtime or in shifts, embracing of part-time work, and being typical of those who primarily take time off to attend to sick children. The invention of household appliances has freed men and women from domestic duties, resulting in higher levels of happiness. In most households in OECD countries, men are still more likely to be in paid work, while women often reduce the hours spent in paid work and take on the bulk of unpaid work in the home. In the EU labor market, the participation of mothers is 12.1% lower than that of women without children. Yet, there is evidence that when women earn more, at least up to a point, it lowers their housework burden, which suggests that money yields power in male-female relationships. Number 19. No matter how good an argument is, the truth of the conclusion cannot be established if any of the argument's premises is false. The acceptability of premises rests on whether they represent knowledge commonly believed to be true. For example, it is known that penguins live close to the South Pole, whereas polar bears are found at the North Pole. Therefore, the premise, because polar bears hunt penguins, is not acceptable because it contradicts two pieces of common knowledge. Another important factor is the variability of the data underlying the premise. Suppose you had three blonde female friends, and each of them ended up marrying blonde men. How confident would you be in the generalization blonde women tend to marry blonde men. Even though three out of three instances confirm your conclusion, this is a very small sample. Results vary, and there may be many alternate explanations of your data. You may be amazed by the coincidence, and you may see the pathway of inductive reasoning that allows you to arrive at this conclusion. 
However, the variability of the data suggests that the conclusion is wrong. Number 20. Cortisol, the unhappy chemical, evolved to signal physical pain. You may be surprised to learn that pain is valuable information. It motivates you to take your hand off a hot stove, fast. You don't have to touch a hot stove twice because the brain stores everything going on while cortisol flows. You immediately learn to avoid anything resembling that hot stove. This ability to store and retrieve experience rests on a chemical called acetylcholine. It triggers the remember what happened the last time you did that feeling. Adrenaline adds the sense that something is ultra urgent. If you decide to walk over hot coals, a surge of adrenaline alerts you to the very high stakes. Adrenaline and acetylcholine respond to good things as well as bad things, such as a glance from a special someone or a delicious smell. They rev your engine for action, but cortisol tells your engine to avoid rather than approach. Cortisol is the chemical that distinguishes bad excited from good excited. Number 21. There is only one type of molecule that your body ever repairs, and that's your DNA. DNA molecules, the critical and sole source of molecular templates for all other molecules and the blueprints for everything in your body, are continually being checked, repaired, and then rechecked. Damage is never tolerated. The process of monitoring and repairing your DNA is complex and metabolically costly, but it's essential. When the cell identifies damage, it either repairs the problem or else stops all future cell divisions to prevent the error from being passed on to daughter cells. Occasionally, this safety mechanism fails and damaged DNA is passed on to daughter cells. All too often, these are cancer cells. The repair of DNA, therefore, has a high priority as the cost of not repairing the DNA is often the death of the entire organism. Number 22. Language affects how people think and what they pay attention to. Language allows us to perceive certain aspects of the world by naming them and allows us to ignore other parts of the world by not naming them. For instance, if you work in a job such as fashion or interior design that deals with many different words for color distinctions, you will be able to perceive finer differences in color. Knowing various words for shades of white, such as ecru, eggshell, cream, ivory, pearl, bone china white, and antique white, actually helps you see differences in shades of white. Similarly, there are concepts that people do not fully perceive until a word is coined to describe them. Think of words added to American English vocabulary in the last few years, such as texting, couch potato, or mouse potato. The behaviors to which those words refer certainly existed before the terms were coined, but as a society, we did not collectively perceive these behaviors until language allowed us to name them. Number 23. Fluency is a term that refers to the ease associated with information processing. For example, a clear image is easy to process or fluent. A feeling of disfluency while processing information leads people to take something of a slow-down, be-careful approach to making judgments and decisions. Researchers have examined this tendency using the cognitive reflection test. In one study, the test was printed in either a normal, highly readable font or a degraded, hard-to-read font. Performing well on the cognitive reflection test requires suppressing an immediate gut feeling to get the correct answer to each question. For example, a bat and ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? You need to think beyond the immediate response of $0.10 cents to arrive at the correct response of $0.05. Cents. $0.05 cents plus $1.05 equals $1.10. Participants gave more correct answers when the questions were presented in a degraded and hence disfluent font. The difficulty of merely reading the question caused them to slow down, giving their more analytical, reflective cognitive processes a chance to catch up with their immediate intuitive response. 
If the level of fluency in processing information is low, one is more likely to delay immediate responses, leading to more correct answers through more analytical, reflective cognitive processes. Number 24 and 25. The U.S. and many of its Western friends have cultures that are run by time and not surprisingly have the fastest pace. Most people in the U.S. would probably say that they feel rushed. It may be that the ideals and future hopes of American society drive people to be constantly hurried to reach certain goals by specific times. The epitome of success, luxury, and happiness, which is often regarded as an illusion but is a fact, pressures U.S. citizens to constantly do more, earn more, consume more, in order to achieve more. Therefore, for many Americans, free time is less available, and when it is, they often engage in structured competitive activities such as sports, racing, etc. Indeed, in the U.S., people are publicly acknowledged and rewarded for being effective managers of time and exceeding expected productivity goals within certain time constraints. As the saying goes, time is money. As such, in the U.S., relative chronological boundaries are assigned to life stages or phases, which signal societal expectations regarding marriage, first job, children, stable career, and earnings, and retirement. These boundaries, however, can be amended by unexpected forces, which delay or permanently change personal and family career goals. Nonetheless, societal expectations regarding time progression along the life cycle are a force to be acknowledged in a time driven culture. For example, illness or an accident can delay marriage or having a family and disrupt the normal life cycle progression expected in their society. Number 26 through 28. Once upon a time, there was a king who ruled a prosperous land. Poverty was unknown there, and every person was gainfully employed. Hence, the sight of a beggar making his way along the main street of the capital city caused quite a stir. The king demanded to see this strange man. When brought to him, the beggar revealed that he indeed did not have any possessions or any money to purchase food. The king generously offered all you can eat meals for the rest of the week and clean clothes so that the beggar could continue his journey to the next land. Surprisingly, the beggar declined the royal offer and asked for a modest favor. The king demanded to know what the wish was. The beggar humbly requested a grain of rice on the first day, two on the second, four on the third day, and so on, doubling the previous day's contribution. The king looked through the window at the overflowing storehouses and almost accepted it when his chief officer, remembering something that he had learnt in Elements of Numbers, advised His Highness that he should reconsider. To calculate the implication of the wish, the chief officer pulled out a dusty abacus to perform large calculations. He fumbled with it for a while, but could not express the magnitude of the numbers involved because he ran out of beads. The king, getting impatient with his chief officer on such a simple wish from a poor man, officially granted the beggar the wish. Little did he know that he had sounded the end of his reign. The next day, the beggar came to claim his grain of rice. The townsfolk laughed at the beggar and said that he should have taken the king's kind offer for a full meal instead of the tiny grain of rice. On the second day, he was back for two grains. A week later, he brought a teaspoon for the 128 grains that was due to him. In two weeks, it was a non negotiable amount of half a kilo. At the end of the month, it had grown to a huge 35 tons. A few days later, the king had to declare bankruptcy. That is how long it took to bring down the kingdom. Week 8 Mini Test 2 Number 1 Dear Mr. Gordon, It was good to meet with you for lunch last week. I'm glad I was able to fill your needs with the disability insurance policy I recommended to you. I trust you'll be as pleased with this product as you have been with insurance products you have purchased through me in the past. At lunch, you mentioned that you run into a good number of small business owners in your business dealings. 
If you think it is appropriate, I would welcome the opportunity to furnish these people with the same quality of service that I and my colleagues at Atlanta Insurance Benefits Incorporated have supplied you. As I mentioned to you, Atlanta Insurance Benefits has been getting more and more into the area of insurance planning for small business owners. Would you consider thinking of a few business owners you know who could use our services? A referral from you would go a long way in opening new doors for me and my colleagues. Sincerely, Jim Howard. Number two, there were more stars than I could count, and I loved looking at the sky and breathing the frigid, snowy air into my lungs. In the best possible way, I felt insignificant here in the wilderness. I felt like Alaska was holding me, protecting me, and that there was plenty of room to move and breathe. Fascinated by this feeling of wholeness, I sat alone on a bench at the end of the docks and watched the movement of the sky. I could not believe the depth of darkness Alaska enjoyed without the light pollution of a city. For hours, I felt stillness without the tether of another human being. I hadn't experienced that feeling before in my life, and perhaps I haven't had the courage to experience it since. Although I'd been in Alaska only about six hours at that point, I felt like my strength and my hope were returning. I wasn't completely numb any more. I certainly was not afraid. In a moment's time, without trying, the grace of clarity had arrived. Number three, are you waiting for the economy to get better? Will that lift you? Will you be happy then? You might be. But it won't last long because, with your vision limited by seeing only what is on the surface in the outer world, there will always be something to fear around the next turn. If you are waiting for what is seen to lift you, you will most likely feel burdened and lacking life energy, like dead weight, without consciousness. But that is not you. You have a life, and you have much to offer. Raise your level of awareness. And begin to see more clearly. If you focus only on what is seen on the surface, you severely limit yourself, for things are not always as they appear. What is seen on the surface in the outer world is a small fraction of all that is. With limited vision, a full understanding of the truth is impossible, and this is why we fear. Human vision is limited, and we will never be able to see and understand all in life. We can learn to trust in the unseen and thus expand our vision and understanding. Number four, I know a tennis player who psychs out her opponents. When she is losing a close match, she looks for that which her opponent is executing best, something she is doing automatically without thinking, and forces her to think about it. As they pass at the net between games, she will say, "You've got a killer serve. It's ruining me. You're bringing your elbow up high next to your ear, dropping your racket behind your back till it almost touches your belt, reaching high as you swing, and breaking your wrist at the exact right moment. Your serve just whistles." Her opponent had practiced that serve so long she could do it automatically without thinking, but she now finds herself thinking about it. Invariably, that serve is gone for the day, and with it, the rest of her game. This is the old trick of focusing attention on something you do every day, and by doing so, making it possible. Drink this glass of water and do not think of the word alligator. The best psych out I have heard in tennis is: when you raise a racket to serve, do you breathe in or out? Number five. Our picture of women in the Viking Age is very often a static one. We imagine a solid housewife left at home in charge of the farm, while her husband and sons go out on raiding and trading expeditions. Her reward a pretty trinket from England or Ireland when they return. While this picture has some truth in it, there is plenty of evidence that this is not the whole truth. Literary sources suggest that women did go on some of these expeditions, but the archaeological evidence is even clearer. The evidence of burials shows that Scandinavian women, identified largely by their jewelry, reached places as far apart as Greenland and Russia.
In fact, we can find typically Scandinavian female burials in almost all the areas of the world in which we know that the Scandinavians were active, indicating that women also had their part to play in the Viking expansion. Number six. Readers have a right to expect that the quotations used in news stories will fairly depict their range of viewpoints on the subject. Unbiased reporters strive to meet that standard. However, biased reporters try to advance their own personal opinions. One way is to include numerous strong quotations on their side of the issue and only one or two, preferably weak, quotations on the other side. A more blatant approach is to include no opposing quotations at all, and thus create the impression that no responsible person would take the opposing side of the issue. The most dishonest approach is to twist a quotation so that it seems to say something very different. For example, if the quotation were, I initially had some reservations about the program, but after examining it closely, I believe it is excellent. A dishonest reporter might merely say that the person expressed some reservations about the program. Number seven. In the fall of 2009, the National Highway Transportation Safety Agency (NHTSA) received several dozen complaints per month about a particular auto company's cars speeding out of control. The rate of complaint was not that different from the rates of complaint for other car companies. Then, in November of 2009, the company recalled 3.8 million vehicles to check for sticking gas pedals. By February, the complaint rate had risen from several dozen per month to over 1,500 per month of alleged cases of unintended acceleration. Clearly, what changed was not the actual condition of cars. The stock of the company's cars on the road in February of 2010 was not that different from November of 2009. What changed was car owners' awareness as a result of the headlines surrounding the recall. Acceleration problems, whether real or illusory, that escaped notice before November 2009 became causes for worry and a trip to the dealer. Later, the NHTSA examined a number of engine data recorders from accidents where the driver claimed to have experienced acceleration despite applying the brakes. In all cases, the data recorders showed that the brakes were not applied. Number eight. Percentage difference between average hourly earnings for ethnic minority employees and white British employees, Great Britain, 2012 to 2018. The above graph shows how different ethnic groups compared with white British in average hourly pay between 2012 and 2018, where the zero percent line represents white British. On average, the Chinese ethnic group consistently earned more than white British employees throughout the entire period. For those in the mixed or multiple ethnic group, the pay gap switched between positive and negative, suggesting the average earnings for employees from this ethnic group were similar to those of white British employees. Employees in the other white ethnic group, on average, earned less than their white British counterparts between 2012 and 2018. The pay gap between employees in the other Asian ethnic group and white British peaked in 2014, but narrowed after that. The gap in 2014 was two times larger than in 2018. The pay gap for the Bangladeshi ethnic group narrowed somewhat between 2014 and 2015, but in 2018 it improved only a little from its level in 2012. Number nine, like his fellow Venetian painters, Titian. Tiziano Vecelli, who dominated the art world in the city for 60 years in the 16th century, used strong colors as his main expressive device. First, he covered the surface of the canvas with red for warmth. Then he painted both background and figures in vivid colors and toned them down with 30 or 40 layers of glazes. Through this painstaking method, he was able to portray any texture completely convincingly, whether polished metal, shiny silk, red gold hair, or warm flesh. One of the first to abandon wood panels, Titian established oil on canvas as the typical medium. 
After his wife died in 1530, Titian's paintings became more muted, almost monochromatic, extremely productive until his late 80s. As his sight failed, Titian loosened his brushstrokes. At the end, they were broad, thickly loaded with paint, and slashing. A pupil reported that Titian painted more with his fingers than with his brushes. Number ten, charity night walk, twenty twenty one. Join our seventh annual ten kilometer night walk around the streets and raise funds for cancer research. When Saturday, nineteenth of June, nine p.m. to eleven thirty p.m. The walk begins and finishes at the Park Hotel. Course, the walk is a ten kilometer route with the option of completing five kilometers. Entry fee. Twenty dollars. This is the same for ten kilometers and five kilometers. The fee includes a night walk mug. Additional information: Participants are responsible for their own personal items. All participants will receive emergency contact cards. Photographs will be taken during the night walk, which may be published or used for promotional purposes. Please ensure you stay hydrated and don't leave litter along the route. Drinks will be available only at the Park Hotel after you return. To register, visit our website www.nightwalk.org. Number eleven. Time to move T-shirt contest. Join our contest and have a chance to travel around Europe by train. The contest runs from September first to October thirty-first, twenty twenty-one. Participants are grouped into two age categories. Contestants aged between thirteen and nineteen, contestants aged between twenty and thirty. How to enter? Add some basic information about yourself. Upload your creation as an image and write a title. Choose any technique that you think would look good on a T-shirt. The uploaded T-shirt designs must be original and unpublished. The winners will be chosen on November first, twenty twenty-one. You have the chance to vote for your favorite design. Prizes: The first place winner in each category will receive a seven-day Interrail Global Pass. Five contestants with outstanding creations will receive a three-month Infotime magazine subscription each. The ten creation chosen by voting will each win a backpack. Click here for more information about the contest. Number twelve. For millennia, chefs throughout the world have labored to create delicious food. Yet, for most of that history, they labored in obscurity. In the West, only in the 19th century did a few great chefs, like Antoine Carême and Auguste Escoffier, achieve a public persona and some measure of fame. For many decades after these pioneers first entered the public eye, chefs were rarely treated as artists on par with their peers in the visual or literary arts, and for the most part, restaurants well into the 20th century hardly noted their chefs. Today, of course, star chefs seem to be everywhere. Food lovers follow chefs from restaurant to restaurant. Famous consulting chefs license the use of their names to kitchens that they may have never entered. And the Food Network has spawned an entire industry of chef contests and celebrities. The New York Times dining section documents the comings and goings of chefs as if they were baseball stars traded from team to team. Number thirteen. One traditional division of courts is into law and equity. As the royal courts became more rigid and bureaucratic in the 13th century, frustrated litigants. Turned to the king as the source of justice, the king assigned his right-hand man, the chancellor, to provide more flexible justice in cases in which the law courts would not. Over time, the chancellor's exercise of judgment itself became institutionalized in a court of equity. The existence of two competing judicial systems became a point of conflict in the struggles between the crown and parliament, and later between the crown and American colonists. For whom the equity courts were a symbol of royal authority, beginning in the 19th century, the conflict faded as law and equity merged into a single system. Today, equity remains important as a distinctive set of remedies and procedures. When a litigant seeks an injunction, 
a court order compelling someone to do or not to do something, rather than money damages, for example, it is an equitable matter. Injunctions are available in some private cases when the legal remedy of damages is inadequate, as when one business seeks to ban another from illegally using its trademark. Number fourteen, visual attention works something like a spotlight, highlighting a part of a scene while leaving the rest obscured in darkness. Anxiety causes tunnel vision, making it easier to focus on a threatening stimulus such as a weapon. From an evolutionary perspective, this is logical. An early human spotting a lion in a distance while wandering on the savanna would want to keep him in keen focus and not be distracted by anything less dangerous. In the modern world, a modest dose of anxiety can help a student focus on preparing for an exam, or it can help a manager persist in seeking a solution to an office problem. A little anxiety can sometimes even help people solve problems, when analytic thought suffices. But if there is useful information outside of the spotlight of attention, then this narrowness comes at a cost. Focusing on a gun will lead you to the wrong conclusion if you can't broaden your attention enough to notice that it's a toy being carried by a child wearing a Halloween costume. Number fifteen. An Ethiopian proverb says, "When spider webs unite, they can halt a lion." Defensive superiority is the adaptive advantage of cooperative behavior reported most frequently in field studies, and it is the one that occurs in the greatest diversity of organisms. It is easy to imagine the steps by which social integration of populations can be made increasingly complex by the force of sustained predation. The mere concentration of members of the same species in one place makes it more difficult for a predator to approach any one member without detection. Flying foxes, terrapus, which are really large fruit bats, form dense sleeping aggregations in trees. Each male has his own resting position determined by dominance interactions with other males. The lower, more perilous branches of the trees serve as warning stations for the colony as a whole. Any predator attempting to climb the tree launches the entire colony into the air and out of reach. Number sixteen, dream teams are not always so dreamy. When a team of experts comes together, they often work for themselves and not for the good of the whole. This is what happens when companies feel the need to pay mega salaries to get the best talent. Those people are not necessarily showing up because they believe in your why. They are showing up for the money. A classic manipulation. Paying someone a lot of money and asking them to come up with great ideas ensures very little. However, pulling together a team of like-minded people and giving them a cause to pursue ensures a greater sense of teamwork. Samuel P. Langley, who failed to build the world's first airplane, pulled together a dream team and promised them riches. The Wright brothers, who invented the first airplane, inspired a group of people to join them in pursuit of something bigger than each member of the team. Average companies give their people something to work on. In contrast, the most innovative organizations give their people something to work toward. Number seventeen. Since the early seventeenth century, humans have tried to find ways to live peacefully and prosperously with one another in the absence of a common notion of the good. This effort has been identified with liberalism, which has emphasized toleration, individual choice, and maximizing general utility through market mechanisms and government constraints. To this end, liberalism has treated all goods as effectively equal, interpreting them as merely the subjective preferences of individuals. This move entails recognizing and admitting that no good is better than any other good. My preference for justice or moral life is thus essentially no different from my preference for an apple. Thus, no good. Thing, process, activity, way of life, etc., in itself is special, sacred, or necessary. In principle, then, there can be no rational, as opposed to effective, ground for preferring one good over another. Number eighteen, 
The relevance of a global history of textile production over a long period of time is clear. Textile products cater for a basic human need. They are among the most important goods fabricated and traded by mankind, and have thus played a central role in human activities throughout history. It is therefore no wonder that historians have paid so much attention to the basic processes in producing textiles, spinning, and weaving. Numerous regional and national studies on developments in the production of and trade in textiles have been published. Moreover, textiles have also been at the center of several crucial historical debates. In the case of textiles, the most important related and supporting industries are the production of textile machinery, including certain types of electronics and chemicals, especially man-made fibers. Theories on proto-industrialization, the industrial revolution, technological and business history, the history of taste and fashion, and the gendered division of labor often take the textile industry as a point of reference. Number nineteen, both disasters and the agents that produce them are sufficiently complex to defy easy classification. However, the basic distinction is between sudden impact and slow onset. Creeping disasters, the former may occur in a matter of seconds, earthquakes, minutes, tornadoes, or hours, flash floods, while the latter may take months, certain type of volcanic eruption, years, types of subsidence of the ground, or centuries, various forms of land degradation and erosion. There is, in fact, a continuum in both lengths of forewarning and speeds of onset, with no set definition of what constitutes abrupt. Moreover, one cannot make general rules about the magnitude at which a high-intensity event turns into a fully-fledged disaster, as a small-scale geophysical impact may have very serious human implications if it occurs at a locality of high vulnerability. Nevertheless, the severity of sudden impact disasters is usually judged according to casualty and damage figures, while that of creeping disasters is generally related to the size of the affected population and the magnitude of the threat which they face. Number twenty. As no ought statement can be drawn from is statements, it is often contended that normative and generally axiological theories are, by their very nature, basically different from representational ones. This is true to some extent. Still, as is statements, ought statements can be weaker or stronger. Thus, to take a trivial example. Under general conditions, people prefer riding a car smoothly in the city traffic because, as moving is to them, a means rather than an end. They want normally the means to be as little unpleasant as possible. For this reason, they consider traffic lights as a good, though unpleasant, thing. The value statement. Traffic lights are a good thing. Is the conclusion of a valid argument grounded on the empirical, unquestionable statement that traffic is more fluid with traffic lights than without? Though elementary, this example is typical of many normative arguments. It shows that a normative argument can be as convincing as a descriptive one. This is the case when the argument involves empirical statements that can be checked. And axiological statements on which all would agree, as traffic jam is a bad thing. The example also shows that an ought statement can be derived from is statements, provided the set of statements concluding to the ought statement includes at least one ought statement. Number twenty-one. There were definite pitfalls during the development of agricultural settlements. Farming practices often involved continual repetition of the same crop, resulting in gradual depletion of the soil. This, plus the disruption of the soil's natural balance that occurs when the soil is turned, frequently opened the way for erosion. As the soil became exhausted, the quality of the food declined, and ultimately the crops failed. Where man's ingenuity triumphed, where methods of crop rotation and composting were developed. And where the art of restoring and persevering soil fertility was learned, an enduring culture was established. By contrast, where these lessons were not learned, settlers were forced to move on.
The result, during the early stages of the development of agriculture, was one wave of migration after another, sweeping across Asia north and west through Europe or northeast to China, leaving only islands of more firmly rooted communities where the earth and its nutrients had come to be regarded with respect. Number twenty-two. One of the simplest and most cost-effective forms of publicity at your disposal is the news release, also known as press releases. These one to two page documents are sent out by companies and business professionals to tell the world about their new products and services, as well as to remind them how good they are at what they do. In a way, they are little advertisements for your business. Except they don't cost you a thing beyond the time it takes to write them and email them. Generally speaking, newspaper and magazine editors use news releases as filler material. They also use them as idea starters that can be developed into related or more detailed stories. Because news releases are used on a space available basis, there's no guarantee that yours will get into print. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying, because when one does hit print, the evening TV news or drive-time radio, it's free publicity. Number twenty-three. Yale psychologist Patricia W. Winville noted that people vary in their self-complexity. Some have high complex self-representations. Their self-concepts include many distinct aspects. Others have less complex self-representations. Their self-concepts include a small number of highly interrelated aspects. When people experience a negative event that challenges one aspect of their self, their self-complexity may determine the extent to which their negative feelings will spill over into other aspects of the self. If self-complexity is low and all aspects of the self are highly interrelated, a failure in one area can make one feel incompetent in all other areas as well. A poor grade may mean not only that one is a poor student, but also that one is a lousy daughter. In contrast, if self-complexity is high and the different aspects of the self are quite distinct from one another, the negative fallout from failure in one area of the self will remain restricted to that area. One may feel like a poor student, but still think of oneself as a fine daughter. If a person has multiple self aspects, negative experiences have smaller impacts on them because they have varied, distinct aspects of the self that remain uninfluenced. Numbers twenty-four through twenty-five. We often appeal to each other. Be reasonable, promoting reason as a common sense approach that puts us at our decision-making best. This point of view suggests that emotions must be kept out of sound decision making. But if reasoning is the only strategy we use, expedient decisions aren't going to take place. At the very least, the decision making will take an excessive amount of time because we have so many factors to consider. The pure reason process advocated by Plato and Descartes is really more like the strategy patients with cortical prefrontal damage use to make decisions. Several forms of dementia plagued my father before he passed away. He had lost considerable access to his value system. Before advanced dementia, he always chose an O. Henry chocolate bar as a sweet treat. In the latter years, when I took him to a candy counter, he would scan the display for several minutes, reaching, hesitating, and finally choosing. He never chose an O. Henry bar, and the process seemed to take an eternity. I'm sure his final choice was based on giving up and taking the most appealing package within reach. It appeared that he lost the ability to make value-based decisions. When faced with a value-based choice between several competing selections, his decision-making landscape appeared hopelessly flat. From an expedient point of view, it is much more adaptive to have some form of neurological device that automatically stamps a subjective value onto our experiences. Without a value system, what would we do about hairstyle, choice of fashion, shoes, color of shirt, or musical preference? How would your friends respond if you told them they were your most rational choice for relationships? Numbers twenty-six through twenty-eight. 
At seven o'clock on a Friday evening, a twenty-five-year-old Master of Business Administration (MBA) student was listening intently to the words of his fifty-five-year-old aging professor during a class in organizational behavior. The student was on a fast-track graduate degree, which his employer felt he needed to better serve the company. The struggling student was attempting to balance his work and family life while pursuing a master's degree in business administration at the same time. It was certainly placing a great deal of stress on him and his family. He had young children and a working wife who missed him greatly when he took evening and weekend MBA courses. During the lecture, the professor said, "I feel sorry for you people." Because you have no choice but to be here doing something which is work, you have to be here because you and your employer believe that an MBA degree will be mutually beneficial. He later commented on the career life cycle of the MBA degree in the corporate world, which the student found disconcerting, because he believed with the MBA degree he could climb the corporate ladder to the top and stay as long as he did his job. However, the professor said, "After about five years, your MBA degree will have far less value then than it will now. In fact, after about forty, you will become obsolete. Think how many people in your organization are over forty." The student's mind left the classroom briefly, returning to his workplace and the CEO of the company, his boss, who was beginning to gray a little at forty-one and was the only one he could think of over forty. The student wondered if the professor really knew what he was talking about. He thought, "How could what he's saying be true? After all, it's common knowledge that those who teach do so because they can't do real work." Monday morning, right after he arrived at his desk at work, his boss called him into his office. "We need to have a candid discussion because there are some things you need to know," the CEO said. The student worker became anxious because of the CEO's comment. The CEO asked him to pull up a chair and sit down. We've been struggling to make our numbers for quite a while, and I firmly believe it's because of these terrible economic times, about which I might add we have no control. Despite that, the board of directors has decided to replace me with someone else, so I'll be leaving at the end of the month. Week nine. Mini test three. Number one, dear valued guest, welcome to Sea View Hotel. We are looking forward to helping you have a comfortable stay here. Currently, we are renovating bathrooms, starting with the fourteenth floor and working our way down. Although you may have occasion to see or hear workers during the day, we're striving to minimize disruptions. If you do not want to be disturbed while you are in your room, please feel free to use the "Do Not Disturb" sign on the door of the room. We'll respect your privacy, and if the renovations ever become a nuisance, please call the front desk, extension five six five six. Our staff will do their best to help out. Please understand that the renovations are but one example of our commitment to providing first-rate service. Thank you for your cooperation. Sincerely, Brian Campbell, Sea View Hotel Manager. Number two. The confirmation of the bank transfer appeared on the computer screen. Everything seemed to be in order, and the transaction had been done successfully. At least that was not going to be a problem. The money collected at the party was already safe at its final destination. I did it. Catherine congratulated herself as she scrolled down the web page and read how much the money she had raised would help protect hundreds of animals in danger of extinction. For her, there was no better feeling than the one she got when she fought for a change in a world she believed was losing its essence. Perhaps the women who collaborated with her in her fundraising events didn't really make donations for selfless reasons. Giving money to charity in order to save in taxes was a more feasible motive, but Catherine hoped that deep down inside they would find joy in sharing a little of what they had with the rest of the world. Number three. 
The review process involves objective referees reading and commenting on the value of your work, as well as offering ideas about how it might be improved. I think it is best to discover what you might learn from the process as opposed to adopting a defensive or combative approach to responding to reviewers. Reviewers may be wrong in some cases, but more often than not, when I approached reviewer reports with an open mind, I discovered that there was something about how I had written the paper or failed to write the paper that led a reviewer to make a particular comment. Try to understand why a smart member of the profession might have written what you see in the review. Put yourself in the position of a new reader to your paper. This means forgetting about information coming later in the paper or your own elaborations of what you have written. Instead, consider what the words you wrote actually communicate and how you organized your paper to understand how the reviewer drew an inference or missed something. In my experience, I am at fault at least 90% of the time. Number 4. As consumers have increased the share of their spending devoted to education, health, leisure, and entertainment, they have decreased spending devoted to traditional consumer goods. Groceries, clothes, shoes, furniture, and large household appliances. Even in the innovative electrical leisure sector, falling prices have offset increased sales volumes. In part, this is the result of saturated markets. An aging population consumes less calories per head and has acquired a stock of durable items, leaving only a replacement market. Most households have so much stuff that they no longer know what to use or where to store it, hence the growth in charity shops and car boot sales. In the United States, one growth industry is personal lockups, where surplus items can be stored and brought out on a rotating basis. Partly it is because of the improved quality and life expectancy of many products, especially motor vehicles and clothing, which need replacing less frequently, and partly it is because of changing personal attitudes to possessions which are no longer deemed by many to be an indicator of personal success and status. As the American retail commentator Carol Farmer has written, we have entered the less decade. Number 5. That we make rational calculations about whether or not to trust is a matter of common experience. Every day we make calculations about the trustworthiness of those with whom we have dealings, basing our conclusions on observations of their past behavior with others, by how well we know them, by gossip, by superficial characteristics, such as how they are dressed, and so on. Evidence to prove untrustworthiness may be available, but evidence to prove trustworthiness is in principle impossible to obtain. Trust is usually based not on adequate evidence, but on the lack of contrary evidence, and is thus vulnerable to disconfirmation. A trusts B because B has never let him down, but he might. By contrast, distrust, once acquired, is resilient, for it leads to behavior which reinforces the distrust itself. From a rational perspective, it usually pays to start off by trusting, because trust is necessary to find out if the other party is trustworthy, because trust implies a likely-to-be-fulfilled expectation of reciprocation, and because trust is a resource that is not necessarily depleted by use. Number 6. In his essay, Going Green But Getting Nowhere, Gernot Wagner instructs, The changes needed are so large and profound that they are beyond the reach of environmental individual action. He confesses that he does not eat meat, does not drive, and knows full well the futility of his choices. It is changes in our collective way of life, at a national and international scale, major structural changes that will make enough of a difference that the planet will actually notice. He points out that airlines now list voluntary carbon offsets on their booking website pages, but these offsets are less than a drop in the bucket and serve as marketing ploys to make the eco-conscious feel better about flying and in turn book more flights. A real solution? A heavy dose of government policy to provide the right kinds of incentives would be a good start.
On both a national and an international level, governments can redirect market forces to make dirty energy exorbitantly expensive and clean energy very cheap. Instead of sweating the small stuff, as Wagner puts it, we should be focusing our collective energies on working to enact planetary scale policy solutions. Number seven. It is time for a deeper probe in a different setting, entered at a different angle, to a greater depth, and exploring a deeper causation. Why have the creative arts so dominated the human mind everywhere and throughout history? We will not find the answer in the finest art galleries and symphony halls. The innovations of jazz and rock, arising more directly from human experience, will probably give us a better idea of where to excavate. Because the creative arts entail a universal genetic trait, the answer to the question lies in evolutionary biology. Bear in mind that Homo sapiens has been around about 100,000 years. But literate culture has existed for less than a tenth of that time, so the mystery of why there are universal creative arts comes down to the question of what human beings were doing during the first nine tenths of their existence. Number eight, interview survey on diet types of 1,000 U.S. adults. The table above shows the results of an interview survey on diet types conducted among 1,000 U.S. adults aged 18 and older in December 2019. Nearly two-thirds of the interviewees identified themselves as omnivores, with 73% of women and 83% of the 65 and over age group enjoying both animal and plant-based foods. By gender, the percentage of pescatarians, vegetarians, flexitarians, and vegans were all higher for men than for women. Among the three age groups, the oldest age group had the lowest percentage of pescatarians, vegetarians, flexitarians, and vegans. Almost one out of ten male adults reported they had a pescatarian diet, which includes fish. And the same percentage of male adults reported themselves as flexitarians, who eat mostly vegetarian food but consume meat or fish occasionally. Of female interviewees, pescatarians accounted for the lowest percentage, and the percentage of vegans who eat only plant-based foods was three times that of pescatarians. Number nine. Most parrots are sociable and rest or sleep in huge flocks. Cockapoos are generally solitary, although conservation workers have reported that they seem to enjoy the company of humans. Each cockapoo has its own territory, which covers up to 0.5 square kilometers (0.3 square miles). It is here that they spend much of the day, hidden from sight in the undergrowth. At night, they come out to feed, clambering around in the treetops. Where they use their wings to help them to keep their balance, these appealing, round-bodied birds can be surprisingly agile on the ground too. The cockapoo's soft feathers are little use for flying; instead, it has developed strong legs. As the cockapoo is mainly vegetarian, it does not need to run to pursue prey, but it can walk with an almost comical rolling gait at surprising speeds. Number ten. Future Stars One Day Cheerleading Camp. Future Stars One Day Cheerleading Camp is designed to develop confidence, athletic skills, and teamwork for kids. No difficult stunts will be performed, with the main focus on fun. While each cheerleader learns important life skills such as team building and leadership. Age range, ages five to eight. Participant to coach ratio approximately five to one. Ages nine to twelve, participant to coach ratio approximately ten to one. Entry fee, fifty dollars. Each participant receives a camp T-shirt. Camp schedule: Friday, July sixteenth. Morning session: nine a.m. to twelve p.m. Lunch: twelve p.m. to one p.m. Provided. Afternoon session: one p.m. to five p.m. Dinner. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. provided. Evening session: 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. 
what to bring, appropriate clothing, a water bottle, comfortable shoes, and sunscreen. Register online, www.fscheerleading.com, with just a 30% deposit to secure your registration. Number 11. BH200 Bluetooth Headphones Instruction Manual Switching the headphones on and off. Press the on-off switch down to turn on the headphones. A blue light will turn on to show that they are powered. Press the on-off switch up to turn off the headphones. The blue light will turn off to show that the headphones are no longer powered. Pairing the headphones to a compatible Bluetooth device. When the blue light starts flashing, it is ready to pair. With your Bluetooth device turned on, start scanning. The headphones will show up under Available Devices as BH200. Select it and start pairing. Playing and pausing audio. With the headphones paired, press button A once to start playing. Press button A again to pause playing. If you want to resume playback, simply press the same button again. To answer, end calls. When you receive a call, press button B once to take the call. To end the call, press button B again. If music is playing, it will stop automatically when you take the call and start again when you end the call. Number 12. The quality of entertainment is often measured by an audience to the degree that it invokes an emotional response among that audience. This leads to opinion. The degree to which we are emotionally affected by entertainment typically influences our opinion of how good or bad we think it is. If, after watching a stand-up comedian, a member of the audience stated, That was really funny. It would suggest that the person thought the comedian was good, which contains a suggestion of recommendation. By watching a show that is labeled a comedy, this person expected to feel positive emotions, including happiness, amusement, and joy. These emotions are then physically transformed by the audience into laughter and applause. A comedian that doesn't invoke an emotional response among the audience that results in laughter and applause is usually considered as being not funny and therefore a poor comedian or low-quality entertainment in the opinion of that audience. Number 13. Organizations in which leaders employ a single style even if this style has worked well in the past, will find themselves at a disadvantage compared with competitors who move faster because they have mastered the multidimensional approach of wakefulness. Organizations with wakeful leaders are more open to change and therefore encourage organizational learning, both inside and outside the work environments. These organizations encourage workers to continuously question current processes in the workplace and to suggest improved methods. They focus on encouraging continuous education among their workers, realizing that even though some workers may exit once they have obtained an increased level of skills and knowledge, workers who feel valued and encouraged are less likely to leave a nurturing environment. This decreases turnover and enhances the organization's quality of output, which in turn positively affects the bottom line. Number 14. If the scientific problems you want to solve require the use of expensive equipment, you should ask for it. As a scientist, you certainly do not want to arrive at your new institution and then have to sit around for months, unable to begin useful scientific work. In getting the working conditions you want, the key concept is leverage. Generally, this takes the form of job offers from competing institutions. Once you have turned down your other job opportunities and are committed to the institution whose offer you have accepted, your leverage is greatly reduced. Of course, your new boss has an interest in your success, but dividing limited departmental funds is a zero-sum game. And when you arrive as a new hire, you are at the bottom of the heap. Your credibility as a scientist is marginal, 
and therefore you are not in a good position to win battles for money, space, working conditions, or whatever. The time to negotiate is before you have eliminated your other options. Number 15. My parents came to visit me a few weeks ago. On the second day of their stay at my house, my dad expressed his frustration with my kitchen trash can in no uncertain terms. He said the lid was annoying and fell off more than he would ever tolerate. He was pretty amazed that I had been living with such a deficient trash can. I had not noticed any issue until he spoke up about it, but after they left, I could not believe it either. My trash can was annoying. The lid was precarious, and the bag slipped about once a week. I had been living with it for months, but after my dad pointed out the problem that I had been ignoring, I had to do something. That trash can has been replaced. The same happens in many different contexts. The people in the system will become blind to its weaknesses and inefficiencies. If you are able to keep your eyes open for those problems and then work to solve them, you will become more creative, not because you have the magic touch, but because you solve the problem that everyone else had missed. Number 16. Declining fertility is a wake-up call, showing that governments need to do more to support working mothers if they want young women to keep on having enough babies to stave off rapid population aging. But supporting work-family reconciliation policies also matters from the point of view of overall social equality. States that rely on markets to provide care services without providing government subsidies are counting on the availability of a large cohort of workers who will provide care for low pay. But those who are getting paid the least also have children who need to be taken care of, and their care solutions may be quite limited by lack of resources. This can result in children who do not receive excellent care or a great start in life. When countries provide affordable, high-quality care to all children, they help to equalize the chances that all children will be cared for well, talked and read to, and given a start that sets them up to flourish emotionally and intellectually. Number 17. Genes can be present in your body, but in a dormant state, waiting for the right environmental trigger to activate them what is called gene expression, a traumatic experience, a good or bad diet, how and when you sleep, or contact with an inspiring role model can cause chemical modifications to your genes that in turn cause them to wake up and become activated, or go to sleep and turn off. The way the brain wires itself up, both in the womb and throughout the lifespan, is a complex tango between genetic possibilities and environmental factors. Neurons become connected whenever you learn something, but this is subject to genetic constraints. If you've inherited genes that contribute to making you five feet tall, no amount of learning is likely to get you into the NBA. More subtly, if your genes constrain the auditory memory circuits in your brain, perhaps because they favor visual-spatial cognition, you're unlikely to become a superstar musician no matter how many lessons you take, because musicianship relies on auditory memory. Number 18. Historical milestones and eras are defined by what one views as important, and for space expansionists and many late moderns, the most decisive novelties and defining features of human history are largely technological. Eras from the Stone Ages through the agricultural and industrial revolutions take a distinct character because of the technologies humans employed in conducting their basic activities. Major changes in technologically enabled and defined macro-historical human trajectories also bring major changes in the spatial and geographic scope of human worlds. The simulation of flight trajectories of space vehicles requires the knowledge of the various forces and moments which act on these vehicles. With major new technologies, what is possible changes with far-reaching implications for core human activities.
and with them also comes new choices and new debates about what is likely to happen and what should be done. For this way of thinking, the main pattern in the larger scale human trajectory has been rising empowerments and growing capacities to do more at a distance. And this process, occurring on a spatially finite planet, has produced successive globalizations. Number 19. Amid national concern over growing rates of obesity, the Healthy Communities Movement has highlighted evidence that people living in poorer neighborhoods often lack access to healthy, affordable food and opportunities to be physically active in their daily lives. Community groups and public health professionals in Duluth, Minnesota, recognized these patterns in their community and hypothesized that they contributed to the higher rates of chronic disease and shorter life expectancies in lower-income areas of the city. Despite being voted Best Town Ever by Outside Magazine, Duluth's poorest neighborhoods had limited access to trails, grocery stores, and safe walking routes stakeholders began learning about national efforts to promote healthier community environments and undertook several projects to integrate these concepts in local land use plans. Over time, these efforts expanded to include transportation, brownfield redevelopment, trails, and health systems planning. This work culminated in a 2016 announcement by the mayor of Duluth that health and fairness would be added as core goals of the city's new comprehensive plan. Number 20. David Hume argues that our idea of causality is mistaken. Philosophers and others commonly think that when one event causes another, the first event exerts some kind of power or force that compels the second to necessarily happen. That is, we believe that the cause forces the effect to happen, so that the effect necessarily has to happen when the cause acts. According to the common view, then, there is some kind of real connection between a cause and its effect. And when the cause acts, the effect has to follow. But Hume asks us to look carefully at any case of one object causing another object to do something. Take, for example, a rapidly moving billiard ball that strikes a second billiard ball so that the second ball moves rapidly away. No matter how hard we look, he says, all we will see is one ball moving quickly, then touching the second ball, and then the second ball moving quickly. We see nothing more. Specifically, we see no necessary connection between the objects, no power or influence going from one to the other. We just see one event followed by another event, but see nothing anywhere between them. Number 21. It is commonly believed that play is an essential part of developing and honing future predatory skills, but experiments have shown that this is not necessarily true. Cats become competent predators through a variety of different experiences, and many different factors contribute to the development of predatory skills. Some kittens take a long time to become good at catching prey, and others are skilled predators from an early age, but these individual differences do not generally continue throughout life, and kittens that are poor predators have generally caught up by the time they become adults. Experiments have shown that predatory skills can be improved by early experience, and for a kitten to learn to kill prey, the experience does not necessarily have to be hands-on. It seems that simply watching the mother or another cat kill a rat is enough to teach a kitten how to deal with live prey. This observational learning is facilitated if the cat performing the act is familiar to the observer cat. When dealing with live prey, kittens tend to follow their mother's selection, and willingness to try new foods is also strongly influenced by the mother. Number 22. One way to begin to define myth is to contextualize it on a continuum of all the narratives constructed of words, poems, realistic fiction, histories, and so forth all the various forms of narrations of an experience.
If we regard this textual continuum as a visual spectrum, we may use the metaphor of the microscope and or telescope to epitomize the extreme ends of this narrative vision. The end of the continuum that deals with the entirely personal, a realistic novel or even a diary, the solipsistic, this never happened to anyone but me, is the microscope. This is where I would situate a dream or the entirely subjective retelling of an experience. Some novels on this end of the continuum may be contrasted with myths in several respects. They depend on the individual. Character is all important. They say this could only happen to this one person, or at least only did happen to this one person. In most myths, by contrast, character, except in the broadest terms, young or old, wise or foolish, doesn't count at all. Myths say this could happen to anyone. Yet some novels are more like myths than others. Many novels assume that the drama of a few representative men and women speaks to our condition. Number 23. With the exception of the soap opera format, television dramas in Britain largely operate as short-run series with as few as six episodes, constituting a single season, and only one or a handful of seasons making up the entirety of a program's run. As a result, writers for such series can plot out prescribed endpoints to stories before launching production. In contrast to this definite end model, American network television generally operates through the infinite middle model, wherein writers for successful programs have to continually devise ways to delay the narrative endpoint in order to keep the show running for over 20 episodes a season, year after year, while also bearing in mind that a show could be cancelled at virtually any time. As Russell Davies, the British screenwriter and television producer, said of the American remake of his own show, the most important thing is to think of the U.S. version as a new show, a different show. Even before they'd written a word, a 22-episode series is a profoundly different thing, a different concept to an eight-parter. Unlike British television dramas with fixed narrative endpoints, the style of American television dramas requires writers to constantly seek ways to make a show longer running. Number 24 through 25. The conceptual development of emotional intelligence required relating it not only to intelligence research, but also to research on emotion. We began with the observation that emotion and intelligence have often been seen as adversaries, with emotions viewed as an intrinsically irrational and disruptive force. For example, the idea that the mind is hijacked by intense emotional experiences, although true in some instances, emphasizes how emotions disrupt thought. In many instances, however, extreme emotional reactions promote intelligence, by interrupting ongoing processing and directing attention toward what may be important. In this sense, they prioritize cognition. We view emotions of all sorts as potentially contributing to thought rather than disorganizing it. Our concept of emotional intelligence is primarily focused on the complex, potentially intelligent tapestry of emotional reasoning in everyday life. For most healthy individuals, we assume that emotions convey knowledge about a person's relationships with the world. For example, fear indicates that the person is facing a relatively powerful or uncontrollable threat. Happiness typically indicates one's harmonious relations with others, and anger often reflects a feeling of injustice. According to this view, there are certain generalities and laws of emotions. These general rules and laws can be employed in recognizing and reasoning with feelings. For example, certain universals of emotional expression exist, and people should be able to recognize them. Emotional reasoning, therefore, extends into questions about relationships. For example, an insulted person might feel anger, or if the person was insecure and non-assertive, might feel shame, humiliation, or repressed anger.
Recognizing these reactions requires some form of intelligence. Number 26 through 28. Ron Clark, the great Australian distance runner, first came to international public attention during the 1956 Melbourne Olympics when he was given the enormous honor of lighting the Olympic flame to formally begin the Games. Though he didn't actually compete in those games, he went on to a great career, notwithstanding the fact that his peaks, standing out like the Himalayas, fitted neatly right between the 1960, 1964 and 1968 Olympics. Famously, he never did win an Olympic gold, despite being perhaps the greatest long-distance runner of his era. In June 1966, Clark was invited to an athletic meeting in Prague by Emil Zatopek, the great Czech distance runner of the 1950s. Zatopek was to distance runners what Sir Edmund Hillary was to mountaineering, the first man through the barriers for all the others to follow and he had long been an admirer of Clark's style. After the meeting, the four-time Olympic gold medalist and national hero guided the young Australian around Prague for the day, showing him fine hospitality throughout, talking about this and that, and the art of running in particular. That afternoon, the Czech champion took Clark to the airport, took him past the guards, right up the steps of the plane, before warmly shaking his hand and pressing a tiny package into his palm and whispering a few words. What the... Zatopek was gone. Was it some sort of message, or something he had to take to the free world? Microfilm, maybe? Clark sat in his seat, sweating a little. He determined that under no circumstances would he open the small package until he was back on the ground in London. But somewhere over the English Channel, he could resist no longer. Looking surreptitiously over his left and right shoulder to see no one was watching, he fished the package out of his pocket and opened up the little box inside. It gleamed back at him. It was an Olympic gold medal, the very same that Zatopek had won in the 10,000 meters at the 1952 Helsinki Olympics. It was even newly inscribed, to Ron Clark, 19 July, 1966, with Zatopek's final words on the plane steps coming to him, not out of friendship, but because you deserve it.